Good morning and welcome to the City Council's seventh day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2017. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I'm the Chair of the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Education, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Drum. We've also been joined by Minority Leader Mario and Councilmember Rodriguez. Today we will hear from the Department of Education, School Construction Authority. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting this hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKinney, the Committee Counsel, Rebecca Chasen, Deputy Directors, Regina Parita Ryan, and Nathan Toth, Finance Analyst, Elizabeth Hoffman, Kenny Grace, uh, Brandon West, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, New York, Nicole Anderson, Myra Pagan, Maria Pagan, and Roberto Caturano, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 24th, beginning at approximately 3 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, thank you. You can email your testimony at the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts off with the Department of Education. The department's fiscal 2017 executive budget totals $23.1 billion, which represents a $1.2 billion increase from fiscal 2016's adopted budget. The department's executive budget includes some significant changes from the preliminary budget, the preliminary plan, such as $64.5 million for special education programs, $19.1 million for the Mayor's Equity for Excellence Plan, which includes Algebra for All, AP for All, and College Access, $17.6 million for expanding career and technical education as called for by the Council in its budget response, and $9.1 million for physical education in order to bring all elementary students into compliance with the state mandate. However, the budget does not include funding to provide universal free lunch to all public school students, which is something the Council has urged the administration to support. The 2015-2016 school year was the second year during which the Council funded universal free lunch in all standalone middle schools. In these schools, the students' participation in the lunch program has increased 6% without any drop in Title I. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. In Title I funding, as the DOE claimed would happen. In fact, Title I form collection is actually better in schools with universal free lunch compared to schools without it. Free lunch not only ensures that no student goes hungry, but also many may increase academic achievement and reduce the stigma of bullying associated with free lunch at school. The Council will continue to negotiate with the administration throughout its budget process to ensure the funding for these important programs is included. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to five minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at three minutes per council member. I will now turn my mic over to uh, co-chair, uh, to council member, right, council member Drum for his statement, and then uh, we will hear testimony from our chancellor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair uh, Ferreras Copeland. Uh, good morning. I'm Councilmember Danny Drum and Chair of the Education Committee. Welcome to the fiscal 2017 Executive Budget Hearing on the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority. We will start today by hearing from the DOE's Chancellor, Carmen Farina, who will discuss the expense and operating portion of the DOE's Executive Budget, and then we will hear about the DOE's Capital Plan from Deputy Chancellor Elizabeth Rose and SCA President and CEO uh, Lorraine Grillo. The Department of Education's fiscal 2017 operating budget totals $23.1 billion in the executive budget, which represents 27% of New York City's budget. If you combine that with the SCA's budget of $14.9 billion, that represents 45% of the city's entire budget. DOE's executive budget on the expense side is $1.2 billion more than the DOE's fiscal 2016 adopted budget. And while I support many of the new needs added in this plan, there are still unanswered questions that I have about some of the administration's priorities and spending choices. The biggest change in the DOE's executive budget is new needs, is, is new needs for special education programs, which will expand existing programs, provide better support for schools, keep students in district schools, and enable the DOE to do a better job addressing student IEP mandates. 
This is a great improvement, and I'm happy to see so much attention on special education programs, and especially in ensuring IEP mandates are properly followed. However, I'm somewhat disappointed to see that nothing has been provided in the budget to better, to better identify and support students with dyslexia. It has been estimated that between 150,000 to 200 students in New York City have dyslexia, and that as many as three-fourths of students with dyslexia have not been identified. Dyslexic students deserve to be identified and helped. Failure to address their needs not only leads to poor performance in school, but affects their social and emotional well-being. With such a great effort to address students with special needs, it is time to address dyslexia in the New York City public school system and really give all students the best opportunity we can to thrive and to succeed. I'm also somewhat disappointed that we did not see a commitment from the DOE to better support LGBT students. Although I have to say, and I'm going off script here, that it was great to be able to see over the last weekend uh, the response from the Department of Education through Jared Fox who's done an excellent job speaking for us uh, in response to the president's um, um, mandate on the treatment of transgender students in the schools. So I think that's something we can be proud of, uh, that we were prepared, that we had those guidelines ready, and that uh, we have an LGBT liaison and we're leading the nation in that regard. Um, so um, I am interested in hearing today what the DOE's commitment and plan is to support the LGBT liaison and LGBT students in the upcoming school year. I'm happy to report that we can see some results in the efforts DOE is making to improve student achievement. A February 2016 IBO report highlighted the advances New York City schools are making in student achievement. And that's really a significant report. That report showed that our students, when you factor in poverty and discrimination, are actually doing better than students from around the rest of the state. I think that's a, a real tribute to what we're doing here in the New York City public school system. According to the report, the 2015 English language arts and math test administers in grades three through five show continued improvement in student proficiency rates in city schools and a shift in the performance of city schools compared to the rest of New York State. That shows tremendous improvement that our teachers, administrators, parents, and schools have been able to make. While these are great improvements, I was somewhat disappointed that Universal School Lunch was not included in the executive plan. This is the second school year with Universal Free Lunch in standalone middle schools, which is funded by the City Council. Ensuring that there is no stigma attached to school food and that all students have access to a healthy and nutritious lunch is something the Council is committed to. It is not only frustrating, but it is also puzzling that the administration does not share this commitment. After two years of universal free lunch, we see there has not been a loss in Title I revenue, that lunch forms or alternative income forms are collected at better rates than in schools with traditional lunch programs, and participation has increased by 6%. We have heard from the administration that they are still evaluating the cost of this program and comparing them to expected changes in lunch participation. But how much more time do you need to evaluate this program it has already been two years and we see the positive results. When can we make free lunch for all New York City public school students a reality? I do want to applaud the Chancellor on all the efforts towards creating more equitable schools. However, I want to make sure the Council and the community are involved in every step of the way. And the State is watching. As we heard in the State Senate hearing on mayoral control, Albany wants to see that the Mayor, the Council, and the community are involved and aware of the choices being made. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the administration and the School Construction Authority for their continued commitment to reducing class size and their $5.7 billion investment in school capacity. We still have work to do, but this is a great start and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Before I conclude, I would like to thank the staff of my committee, Elizabeth Hoffman, Brandon West, and Ken Grace, our finance analyst, Asa Schomburg, our counsel, and Jan Atwell and Joan Pavoni our policy analyst for the committee. I would also like to introduce my colleagues, which I think they have been all introduced at this point. Has anybody in? Okay, uh, Council, we've been joined by Councilmember Garodnik, Councilmember Gibson, and Councilmember Rose. And Councilmember Chin has just joined us as well. Uh, okay. Okay, and we've been joined by some students here in the audience. The Student Leadership Council, from MS582K, Upper Academy, School District 14 is here, 
and the advisors are Ms. Beatty and Ms. Duplain. I hope I said that correctly. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. Great opportunity and a great way to educate students to see the actual workings of government. Thank you for being here. And with that, I'd like to turn this back over. Um, uh, and we welcome the Chancellor and we're going to swear uh, this panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? You may begin. Ferraris Copeland and all members of the Education and Finance Committees here today, I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify and discuss Mayor de Blasio's fiscal 2017 executive budget as it relates to the Department of Education. With me this morning from the Department of Education are Ursulina Ramirez, Chief Operating Officer, and my Chief of Staff, and Ray Orlando, the Chief Financial Officer. I want to thank Speaker Mark Larito, Chair Drum, Chair Ferraris Copeland, and all the members of the City Council for your leadership, partnership, and support on behalf of New York City's 1.1 million students in our school communities. The Mayor and I been, began working together a long time ago. At the time, I was a district superintendent and the mayor was serving on, his local, on my local school board. Fifteen years later, we we're working together to transform the school system and achieve greater equity and excellence in all of our 1,800 city public schools. We have initiated bold, critical reforms that are improving students' education and figures by starting early, supporting strong teachers, providing rigorous curriculum, and engaging communities. I would like to highlight some of our accomplishments. To create clear lines of authority in our school system, we align the responsibilities of supervising and supporting schools under superintendents. We created new geographically based borough field support centers that prove, provide integrated supports to our schools. To share strong practices, we created two important programs, learning partners and showcase schools. Together, these initiatives demonstrate a commitment to professional development and collaboration among educators and schools. Last year, we expanded or created new dual language programs in 40 schools, and next year we're opening new programs in 36 schools, reflecting our commitment to increasing multilingual offerings across five boroughs. Additionally, we created 15 new model dual, dual language programs to foster cooperative practices among dual language educators and provide support and guidance to school staff interested in opening programs. We redesigned our Division of Family and Community Engagement phase to strengthen relationships between schools and their communities. We're providing increased professional development trainings for parent coordinators, parent leaders, and family coordinators. We are pleased that parents are participating more in school-based workshops and attendance at parent-teacher conferences increased by 38% this year compared to the same period last year are adding the student-led conferences as part of our middle school mandate has made a major difference because the students are dragging their parents to parent-teacher conference. And one of the districts, District 14, almost had 100% parent involvement in parent-teacher conferences. To better communicate with the approximately 43% of our parents who speak a language other than English at home, we have expanded language access service, including hiring a new language access coordinator at each of the borough field support centers. We created 130 new community schools, and these community schools are truly what they mean. They are not just for students, they are for their families and the community at large. We invested $23 million annually in arts education funding, allowing for the hiring of 300 new arts teachers and resulting in the most art teachers in a decade, and 22,000 more students receiving arts education. I was at the Metropolitan Museum this past week, and one of the things that we have been encouraging museums to do is have evenings for teenagers. And they just had 4,000 teenagers on a Friday night. And that, to me, is what museums should be doing and can be doing, because they will be the patrons of the future. And if they don't see museums as a place to spend leisure time, we're not going to have those patrons in the future. To continue to engage students in the learning process after school ends, this year's summer school will include a new curriculum college level and STEM oriented enrichment program and visits to some of the city's most important cultural institutions. Both mandated and non-mandated students will participate in these programs. And to see STEM in action uh, this Saturday, I went to Kaiser Park, uh, actually with City Council Mark Traeger and a whole bunch of other people and saw what it was like when the Parks Department, Housing Department and the unions and the DOE come together to do something that's really spectacular. And those are the things we expect to see a lot more of. 
And finally, in collaboration with the City Council, we created approximately 220 new athletic fields, the majority of which are for small schools and for girls teams. As a result, an additional 3,000 students have access to interscholastic athletics. Additionally, with generous funding for the City Council this year, we have been able to provide intensive restorative justice program in 15 schools. And also with City Council funding for the first time, our school communities will benefit from the programming and support of an LGBTQ community liaison. I just want to say a word about Jared Fox. He has been an unbelievable asset to this program. And we decided strategically not only to have him work with teachers, but to start by working with parents, because we felt that if parents were on board, the rest would be easy. And he's been going throughout the city and meeting with all the parent coordinators in the city about how they might talk to parents in their respective schools about different issues. And he's been overwhelmingly well received. And I know the other day he did a New York One interview and really laid the basis of what I think is something New York has done particularly well. Next month, the DOE will host its first ever Pride event to tweet. We also worked with the council to pilot a program in two school districts to provide all middle and high schools with feminine hygiene products to provide all students and their families with free Microsoft software to use at home and to increase civic engagement and voter participation among high school students. At this moment, we asked one of the high schools out in Staten Island to develop a campaign in their elective graphic arts department that will encourage all high school students to go vote, those that are eligible in November, because we want this to be a student-to-student -student campaign. Many of these initiatives would not have been possible without mayoral control. Mayoral control is the best and most efficient way our city can support our students and our schools. Not only is mayoral control a proven system, it's the only system that cuts through chaos, corruption, and dysfunction that pervaded our system for so many years. In my 50 years in education, I have seen every way of governing schools, decentralized, centralized, school boards, regional. I've seen it all and done it all. And I can tell you that we would not have been able to make the positive changes made thus far without mayoral control. It is, has an accountability system, but most important, it also has an efficiency component. The mayor came into office in January 2014, committed to giving New Yorkers free, high-quality pre-K for all. By September 2014, we had expanded free, full-day, high-quality pre-K to more than 53,000 four-year-olds across the city, more than doubling the number of students getting a jump start to their education. Such an ambitious effort and such a meaningful outcome simply could not have happened without mayoral control. This year, more than 68,500 children are on the path to lifelong learning pre-K. That's more children than there are in the entire school district in Boston. And I want to be clear, this is not about numbers. This is also about quality. If you visit a pre-K in the city of New York, there are certain things you're going to see in every single one of them. You're going to see students talking. You're going to see students experimenting. You're going to see students being exposed to things they would not have been able to had they been at home. And the most important thing to me is also that in every pre-K, there is a certain time set aside every single month for parenting classes and parent engagement. So we're hoping that the culture that is done in pre-K will move on. And when I go to kindergarten classes, and I visit them all the time, I always ask the teachers, what's the difference between this kindergarten this year and the ones you've had in the past? And overwhelmingly, I'm hearing pre-K has made a difference. So it's not the numbers, it's the quality and what it has done. And why I'm, okay, under mayoral control, more students are graduating and attendance is improving. This year, the graduation rate was over 70% for the first time in the city's history. And while there's more work to be done to close opportunity and achievement gaps, we're seeing improvements across the board. More of our Latino, black, and Asian students are graduating, and fewer of them are dropping out. At 92.2% citywide attendance is the highest it's been in a decade. While I'm pleased that together we have made critical progress, I know there's still more to be done. The mayor and I have pledged to meet rigorous benchmarks and we will continue to focus on strengthening instruction, expanding opportunities, engaging all families to ensure there's a clear path to college or a meaningful career for our 1.1 million students. To achieve the administration's goal of equity and access through the system, we're implementing several critical initiatives. To boost literacy, the Universal Literacy Program places reading coaches, teachers, with demonstrated literacy instruction in every elementary school. I want to be clear that dyslexia is one of many disabilities and it's one that is most, it's most difficult to diagnose. So 
So there are many ways of dealing with students with dyslexia and this literacy, universal literacy coaches in our pre-K to second grade continuum are one of the answers to that specific problem because many of our teachers are coming into early grades without really knowing how to teach phonics and phonemic awareness. And these coaches are going to be very instrumental in making sure that that happens. The same thing um, with Orton Gillingham trained teachers in Staten Island, for example, there will be at least one, but possibly two Orton Gillingham in every single elementary school starting this September. Algebra for all, AP for all, computer science for all seek to provide students with the skills and courses they need to be successful in college and in today's job market. For too long, we touted how many of our students got into college. Believe it or not, that's not as difficult as it sounds. What is difficult is staying there and certainly going from freshman year to sophomore year. So one of our goals this year is to make sure that the kind of rigorous instruction that the students get and AP for all is part of that rigorous instruction prepares them as researchers, as writers, and as readers to be able to succeed in college. College Access for All Middle School will provide students earlier exposure to college, while College Access for All High School will ensure our students have access to the resources and supports they need to ensure a path to college. This year we had a College Awareness Day where everyone wore um, their alma mater shirts to, to school to be able to talk about college as young as kindergarten. Our kids need to know what the word means, they need to know it's aspirational, and they need to know it's an expected, not something that only certain families aspire to. The single family, the single shepherd program in community district seven and 23 will pair students with dedicated counselors and social workers who will support them through high school and see them into college. We're also asking high schools to once a month have their alum come back and talk to the existing students about how they might mentor and what they need to know in order to stay in college rather than drop out because it is too hard or traveling is difficult. We want to make sure we have those partnerships. All students, regardless of what type of public school they attend, deserve to benefit from the combined knowledge of our supremely talented, gifted teachers and administrators. The district charter partnership program will pair district and charter schools together to foster stronger relationships and the sharing of best practices. Now I will discuss our budget for our schools. The 2017 executive budget includes an allocation of approximately $23 billion in operating funds and another $6 billion of education related pension and debt service fund. Our funding is a combination of city, state and federal dollars with city tax levy dollars making up the largest share at 57%, state dollars at 37% and federal dollars at 6%. The mayor's proposed 2017 budget for our school builds on this administration's progress and makes targeted investments to ensure that students have access to rigorous instruction and instructional and non-academic support to boost student achievement. With the increase in state support this year, we will ensure that no school is funded that at less than 87% of their student funding level. Specifically, the 2017 budget allocates approximately 160 million to schools to increase fair student funding weights for English language learners and SIFE and raise the level of funding access across our schools to average of 91% fair student funding. For too long, English language learners have suffered from non-funded mandates and it is crucial that we actually put money in schools' budgets so they can do right by these students. With an investment of approximately $190 million, the city will continue to provide targeted, tailored support to 94 schools in the Renewal School Program. Uh, recently, Commissioner Ilya has been in New York visiting our Renewal Schools, and she's particularly impressed by the amount of support the schools are getting and the pride that the teachers have in the work that they're doing, and I expect this to be a very successful initiative. In January, the DOE launched a new initiative to provide direct busing for all students in K-6 currently living in a shelter to reduce the travel time and hardship many face. The executive budget also provides funding in 2017 to address the educational needs of students residing in shelters. This new money will go towards targeted new initiatives such as literacy programs and enrollment support inside shelters, additional school social workers, and new technology to ensure DOE staff inside shelters can be in constant contact with families and schools to address attendance and other challenges in real time. Supporting and expanding career and technical education programs has always been among my top priorities as Chancellor. 
The executive budget provides funding for CTE teacher salaries, equipment, consumables, and course materials that will ensure CTE programs have the foundational resources they need. This new CTE funding will strengthen existing programs, approximately 270 across 120 schools, and open 40 new CTE programs by 2018-19, all while developing a performance management system, system, expanding teacher capacity, and completing industry trainings and internships. I want to be clear that one of the um, stumbling blocks in the CTE programs in the past has been state legislation on getting the appropriate licensing for people who work in the CT programs. And Commissioner Ilya actually, on a visit to East River Academy, otherwise known as Rikers Island this past week, assured us that this is one of her priorities that she will fast forward to ensure that the licensing that is required for nursing programs, pharmacy programs, carpenter, will be done and will be done in time for September. Also, um, this weekend when I went to Kaiser Park, for the special STEM event, one of the surprises, and I actually just mentioned it to some of you, and Debbie, I want to talk to you later about this. Um, we are not using the resources of our waterways in the ways that we should, and here was a program that was run by the DOE, the Parks Department, and the Carpenters Union, and the Carpenters Union are also the, is also the union that supports divers, because I, he, as he was explaining to me, the president, you build underwater the same way you build on land, and he's seeking a CTE program to ensure, because these jobs started $80,000 a year. So we need to do more work with our unions and make sure that they are part of our plans. Mayor's executive budget makes an unprecedented investment to move all elementary schools to compliance with state physical education regulations by June 2019. To support this effort, funding has been allocated to support the hiring of more certified physical education teachers and central staff who will provide intensive PE support elementary, middle, and high schools citywide to overcome instructional scheduling and operational barriers. The executive budget also invests significant resources to enhance social emotional learning in our schools through significant funding for restorative justice programs, climate supports for educators in high need schools, and mental health programs. I should say also that as part of our principal training and superintendent training, all of them have been going through an extensive social emotional training as adults on how they may actually bring this back to the field of the people they work with. As part of Thrive New York City, the administration's action plan to support the mental well-being of New Yorkers, all pre-K students will learn social emotional skills and the hundred schools with the highest number of suspension, suspensions will receive mental health supports. Since 2009, the state has not met its court ordered obligations under the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit. In this school year alone, New York City public school students have been shortchanged some $2 billion in state education funds. With adequate funding from the state, we'd be able to hire more arts teachers and guidance counselors in schools throughout the system. While we are confident we're headed in the right direction, we know there is more hard work ahead. I look forward to working with you to build on this work among ex educators and families. Together, we can achieve our goals of making New York City not only the biggest, but the best and brightest urban school district in the nation. Thank you for your support and opportunity to testify before you today. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chancellor. I just wanted to, before we get into questions, to thank you for engaging and always being available, especially when we had our conversations about feminine hygiene product and the difference that it's making in the 25 schools that we are piloting. Um, we've gotten nothing but positive response. And I think in many ways this had led the national conversation and everybody's very eager to see how this is rolled out in New York City so that they can do it. Um, in others, and I'm talking to a lot of legislators across the country. Um, and talking about national and how we're leading our way, I wanted to ask a particular question on the LGBTQ representative. The executive budget did not provide funding to support the LGBT liaison position the council funded in fiscal 2016's budget. Is the, DO, is the DOE going to support this position next year? Which I hope that's a yes. Um, please explain how the DOE will maintain the position for the coming year. And as you mentioned uh, in your opening statement, it's been an incredible, it's a, an incredible resource to have. You spoke of the success of the program. So not only supporting that position, but it also seems to have one person in this huge school system that you run, it seems like he needs more support. 
Um, so kind of if you can walk me through your vision on what you see that position looking like for the next year. Well, I think we have to take this two parts. And the part one is, yes, we would assume um, moving Jared under our finances. It makes sense for many reasons. I think also when you do something that everybody is watching, because they're not only, I mean, we just had 140 superintendents that came to visit us from all over the country on many issues. Uh, you have to make sure it gets done right and that you develop a pattern of how to do it and how to disseminate it. For example, originally when this position became available, we thought it would be teacher education that we would start with that. And although that's important, we found that working through parents first actually made more sense. So a lot of the work um, that Jared is doing, he's doing through um, under Dr. Yolanda Torres and making sure that uh, parent coordinators get trained so that they then can work with other parents. So I think this is the most important thing. I mean, obviously, like everything else, we will be reviewing and then moving forward as we see. But I think training people in the field to be able to answer questions, explain what's happening is our most important thing. I think we're in the way with this particular position right now. Great. Um, we can't um, express often enough that he needs support. And, you know, we would like to see that as this is the big, well, the final steps of our budget negotiating. Um, and we just want to make it uh, 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 an ask for it and make sure that it's on the official record. Now, uh, you mentioned this also in your opening statement, but how's, how does the effects of DOE's current bathroom policy and how the DOE will implement the President's uh, directive? I know that we've been leading the nation, um, but if you can walk us through what that policy will look like, looks like now, um, and if there's any change uh, that, we will, that we should be expecting. Well, we have, been, we have started this already in many schools. Uh, I think it's school by school. Certainly, you know, it's almost like having, you know, a unisex um, bathroom approach. We you know many of our new schools, but also I think it, it, it includes training of teachers, um, parent meetings so that parents understand what's expected. To some degree, this is very low key because we don't see this as a major political, we just think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So certainly I can give you the names of some of the schools that have already done it, and if people want to go visit and see how it's been implemented, I think that's the easiest way to understand that kids are much, students are much better at accepting this, um, sometimes than adults. And now are we, are we able to see this in elementary, junior high and high? I think we're starting to work more backwards with high school and, and middle school, and then what I would also like to note is in Can the... Can you just um, state your name for oh, the record? Oh, sorry. Ursula Nadamita is uh, Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff at DOE. Um, and uh, Deputy Chancellor Elizabeth Rose is also going to discuss this in, in, in her capital hearing. But what we're really working on is a lot of signage issues because we want to make sure that people are aware at the school buildings. And as the Chancellor noted, um, working directly with high schools and then middle schools and elementary schools, but impacting all of our schools. Okay. And, 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 I, and I should say also that as we get more requests from principals, we have identified uh, agencies like the Ackerman Institute and other places that will go to schools and talk to parents, particularly in terms of students who are transgendering, um, because it actually is happening younger and younger. So I think that's part of our policy, who are the people who can support the schools and individual parents. Thank you. Uh, in fiscal 2015's adopted budget, the council allocated $6.25 million to provide free lunch in the middle schools, which unfortunately was used to only fund standalone middle schools rather than all middle schools. Last year, the council requested universal free lunch for all students, but instead the administration decided to serve free breakfast in the classrooms in standalone elementary schools. Uh, why hasn't the DOE committed to extending free lunch to all middle schools, and what are the obstacles preventing us from providing free lunch to all students? Well, this is certainly something we're looking more into. It's a matter of priorities and what we're finding in the standalone middle schools that that was one of the places where um, if you're talking about peer pressure was not only more prevalent but we thought we could lessen it to some degree but I think also with the standalone middle schools we again we didn't just do free lunch what does the environment look like we've actually renovated cafeterias to look more pleasant we've actually sent out people how do you program for lunch so you can have a flip-flop lunch so with a big emphasis on standalone middle schools we have already done uh, a major job of making sure that all students have lunch. I think in terms of going forward, we would certainly look at other places to start. But, you know, here again, there, is, I, there are very few children, if any, that do not eat lunch in any of our schools for lack of any process. 
how does how much is, how much would it cost to expand the uh, universal free lunch to all students? Okay, I, I don't have that number, but okay. I can get it. Okay, we'd for you. like you to get that number to us before we shake hands on this budget. It's important to this council. Um, restorative justice. Last year, the city council funded a restorative justice program using a model that relied on community-based organizations. Much of the work is contracted out, and the DOE has not done a solicitation for restorative justice programming. Since both the council and the DOE are looking to change the way schools handle discipline, isn't it time to find new partners or align the scope of work with new practices? Well, first of all, and I'll, I'll let Ursula be more specific, this is not um, something that you simply hire someone to do. There was a lot of research there involved. What are some of the issues in each school? This is not one size fits all program. How do we train teachers and administrators to make sure that this doesn't become just one more program that gets thrown into a school without anybody buying in? So a lot of the work that had to be done preliminarily is choosing the right schools, training the administrators and the teachers in those schools on what it is to do, and then changing other things so they match with it. And I just want to note, um, we're incredibly grateful for the, the money that we receive for the restorative justice programs. We also have some lessons learned in the process. Um, as you noted, that um, the 15 restorative justice programs that we have in schools didn't get, they got started fairly late within the school year in February. Right. Um, and so with that, we, we learned a lot about, um, you know, how do we both recruit additional CBOs to partner with us. Um, and so we have some work to do for this upcoming So was the year. late start related to the fact that you couldn't find partners? We were working through partners and through our, um, our MCAC process. So we had, we had some internal hurdles of figuring out um, the CBO partners that we currently already have relationships with that could work in our schools. Okay, so what is... I think it's, it's finding the right partners, but making sure also they are exactly that word, partners. I do not want to see programs that are add-ons to the school day. So it means how do you get the principal and the CBO to come and talk together and say, well, this is what I can provide, but this is what my part is. So it's, it's a more of a delicate process, and we want to make sure that these relationships are deep and strong and everybody comes to the table. So I, I fully expect that these will be up and running in September, but it has it's the right partners, the right partnership, and then the right uh, way of evaluating what we're doing. And, and <laughs> Again, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. And since we have some more lead time leading into this upcoming school year, and, and as I said, we learned we had some lessons learned from the implementation this year. Um, we can actually we're figuring out our internal the RFP process that we can do to get more um, CBOs to so that we can solicit more CBOs into working with the DOE. So usually the RFP. RFP process has its own timeline, and it mm -hmm. seems like it's going to be very short for, fis for the next fiscal year. So how are we to be confident that in September you'll be rolling out another, a strong restorative justice program, or can you... S well, I think what we have now that we didn't have last year, we have some models that are already working, but just as an example, we started at community schools. We started a major emphasis on guidance counselors. We have actually started almost depleting the people who can do all this work. So one of the things we want to do with the CBOs is make sure that they're also able to recruit high quality people to work on this. So this has been, we have changed almost our entire philosophy in all our schools to be more socially, emotionally ready for all our kids, starting in elementary school. So there is a, not I wouldn't say a lack, there needs to be more people who can come to the table to provide these services. But it's like pre-K. It's not any pre-K. It's high-quality pre-K. So it's had to be high-quality CBO um, and high-quality training. Thank you. I want to give my colleagues an opportunity to ask their questions. So I'm going to uh, leave my additional questions to the second round um, with a focus on transportation and school custodians. But now we will hear from uh, Chair Drum. So we've been joined by Council Member Gredentrick, King, Reynoso, Miller, Deutsch, Levine, and Rosenthal. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, for Earth Copeland, and thank you, Chancellor, for coming in today and giving your testimony. I'd like to start with citywide savings programs. The DOE has projected a savings of $59 million in the executive budget. $38 million of that savings is coming from E-rate re-estimates and the Intel settlement meaning the savings plan for the DOE is relatively small when compared to the $23.1 billion budget. Can you explain uh, the DOE savings plan and how you calculated these savings? And uh, what is the OTPS savings of $6.1 million? Hi, I'm Ray Orlando. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Um, 
So, so far uh, in this current fiscal year, we've identified $96 million of savings, uh, of administrative savings. And in fiscal year 17, uh, the upcoming year, uh, we have identified $151 million in savings. These savings essentially reflect uh, smarter use of central administrative funds and improved revenue collections. The savings do not come from school budgets or services or any new fees or fines. Um, what we have done is we are eliminating uh, approximately 100 central vacancies that we have. Um, uh, so uh, positions that are currently unfilled uh, will remain unfilled uh, in the upcoming year. And what is the savings on that? Is that 8.4 million? Yes, that's, a, that's the 8.4. Okay. Yeah. Um, we also intend to reduce uh, procession expenses for centrally managed programs. Uh, so not in schools, but centrally managed procession costs. Uh, that is another six and a half million dollars. On the savings in the OTPS budgets of $6.1 million, essentially what we're doing is we're informing uh, central divisions that they will have less OTPS funds to, to spend on things like uh, all your normal OTPS expenses. On, on, what? on all your normal OTPS expenses like supplies, uh, uh, travel, uh, whatever, you know, pick, a, pick an OTPS expense. Um, we're, 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 we're noticing the central divisions that they have to reduce their expenses. So they will just have less OTPS money to spend. That's from the schools? No. No, no I'm sorry. That's central. Oh, that's central. Okay. That's absolutely okay. not in the schools. All right. That's from central. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me go to charter schools. How many special education students attend charter schools? And what is the per pupil tuition rate for special education students in charter schools? And how does this compare to traditional schools? I have a Can you hear this? Yes. Ray has this. Okay. Pardon me, I'm trying to find the page. Apologies. Um, uh, the special education tuition uh, for uh, varies by uh, type of setting, um, as I think you know. Um, so for special education, uh, 20 to 60 percent of the time. Um, in the upcoming year, it will be $24,417. Uh, for a special education setting, uh, more than 60 percent of the time. Um, that is $33,076. Uh, the number of students no, in... The numbers, the, did you say 35% for 24,000? Uh, uh, so if you're in a special education setting for 20 to 60% of the time, okay. that tuition is 24,417. If you're in a special education setting more than 60% of the time, it's the larger number. As to the number of children, in 2017, we are forecasting that there will be in charter schools, uh, in special education settings, 20 to 60 percent of the time, uh, there will be approximately 5,144 students. And in a special education setting, more than 60 percent of the time, we're estimating there would be 7,400 approximately students in the upcoming year. In special ed? Uh, yes, in special ed. And what is the percentage there uh, for charter school enrollment? Uh, I'm trying to do it quick in my head. It'll be less than 5% in the 20 to 60% setting and a little more than 5% in the 60% uh, plus setting. So combined about 10%. And how does that about compare? 10%. How does that compare to the overall um, percentages within DOE schools? District schools. Um, I'll, I'm, I'm looking. I'm not sure I have that. I'm sorry. But I will. I will check. Families. And as the chancellor points out, it certainly varies from school to school. It's 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 getting close to I believe almost 18%. I'm sorry. I believe it's almost 18%. 18% in in, in district schools, mm -hmm. compared to 5% in charter schools. Closer to 10%. In, 
five percent for the twenty to sixty percent of the time, and another five, okay. ish, five a little more than five for the still an eight percent plus. Yeah. So about ten. Um, how many students do you expect to be enrolled in charter schools next year, in general? Uh, in total enrollment, yes. we're forecasting in 2017 uh, charter enrollment of approximately 110,000. Okay. And how much do you anticipate spending on rental assistance for charter schools in the upcoming school year? And, and, and in that, maybe you can give me an idea of... of um, in the current year, uh, we're f uh, in, in fiscal year 17, excuse me, um, we are anticipating uh, spending uh, $40.3 million in 2017. So 40.3, does that put us over the threshold? For we expect to, to hit the, the $40 million threshold in, state. in 2017. And so yeah. how does the state then kick in on that? Uh, we don't have uh, all of the details, but the, what the legislation says is that uh, the state will reimburse us for 60% of the cost uh, of charter rent once we hit that so that's $40 million. So that's 60% of the excess or the amount over the $40 million or? I believe that remains to be determined. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that's cleared yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that we're we haven't hit it yet, so we, yeah. We've got, we got to look at that a little more yeah, closely. Absolutely. All right, and um, how many charter schools will be expanding grade levels in the upcoming school year? Do we know that? Uh, let me see if I have that. Uh, I don't th it's not on my sheet, but I can get it for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to gifted and talented programs. I know that it's been reported that there are four new gifted and talented programs that will open in the upcoming school year. Are there any budget modifications for the opening of the new programs? How many children will qualify for the programs? And um, will any numbers be reduced in other programs in order to accommodate these students? Actually, um, this is a really new paradigm for gifted and talented. The major shifts are that these programs start in third grade, which is what the original gifted and talented was years ago when I started teaching. And the reason for that is that we will now have a wider canvas of all second graders within those districts and we will be able to use multiple measures. So we anticipate that within district, um, certainly in district seven, 20, all the ones that didn't have gifted programs, that all the second graders, uh, will be, their work will be reviewed, so their classwork is part of it, that also uh, whatever assessments, tests are given are part of it. Not so much teacher recommendations, but report cards that the students have had. So we are anticipating and we've already earmarked the schools that we have chosen. The schools all have space, not only for this year, but for ongoing. So we're not displacing any students. The other thing is that now, in order to be a teacher of the gifted, you need special certification. So in a partnership with the New York Historical Society and Hunter College, we have earmarked teachers who are already teaching in the system who wanted to go and get their certification in this program. Because it starts in third grade, there's gonna be a major focus on project-based learning as one of the things that these programs will have. And our anticipation is that for all four districts that have this, that a year from the September, we will also then have either an honors class in neighboring middle schools within these districts, so that it will be a continuum for these students um, going, and right, going right to high school. So I think this is actually going to be a very exciting program. And I think also we've encouraged these districts to include more um, what we call uh, school-wide enrichment models for the other schools in the district. So if parents say, well, I may want my child to go to school X, that the competition within the district, but well, we're gonna do some of the same things. So I'm very proud of this program, and I do think it's going to make a major difference in the four districts that we're putting it in. So those certified gifted teachers, are those teachers who will have um, those classes for three years? Is that, is it, I know that somewhere in the U of T contract that's been mentioned, um, but would those teachers be certified to teach gifted and talented for three years at a time? Yeah, I think the major difference is, is what we call the teacher preference sheets. The teachers who are licensed and in a class and has shown results will have the right to retain those jobs over time. And keeping in mind that every year we're going to open another gifted class. So this year's third grade and you know, these kids will be fourth graders. So um, there'll always be needs for an additional set of teachers in each of these four schools. 
Okay, and let me go now to the respect for all. I know that you changed the program a little bit this year. Can you describe the changes in the program and how it went? Well, I think one of the things we try to do this year is that we want to see more student empowerment and more students deciding what respect for all really means because in some cases it was just about, you know, what is the behavior, what are the incidents, what are the suspensions, and we wanted to see how much more proactive and involved in community endeavors many of the schools were. So um, at the event, which this year it was very clear that many more students were able to speak eloquently as to why they got the prize rather than just a certificate. So I do think we're moving, and it goes with the restorative justice. It's, you know, it's no one issue, it's all these issues coming together um, that really create a different kind of school climate. Let me go to teachers. How many teachers need to be added in order to reduce class sizes to levels specified in the city's state-approved contracts for excellence class size reduction plan, which are 20 in grades K-3, to 23 and 4 to 8, 25 and 9 to 12 core classes? How many more teachers would be needed to meet that? I actually, I, you know, I, we're going to have to get back to you on that. It's, it's a complicated ratio because it's not just uh, increasing the number of teachers, it's also looking at space as well. I don't think uh, the teachers alone would, would get us to a place where we could have the class size reduction to the level of CFE um, had demanded. Okay. Um, and, and, and then finally, and then we'll turn it over to my colleagues as well. Um, how many schools, because this always was an issue for me in my school, uh, have bilingual guidance counselors? Actually, bilingual um, teachers in general are very difficult to come by. And as a result, this year, we have done our recruiting way outside the city. And we are looking to also, and this is something else that the new chancellor, Betty Rosa, has, uh, is going to be assisting. We need to change the state law for reciprocal licensing. We need teachers who are bilingual teachers, uh, teachers who speak other languages, to be able to teach in New York City without having to go through a lot of red tape. And we, now, we know there are surplus teachers in Texas, Oklahoma, believe it or not, and other states who are dying to work in New York City. But the licensing requirements makes it very difficult. So this is one of the conversations I've been just having with the new commissioner, and Mary Ellen and Betty are both committed to doing this. For example, the other thing, we did a major recruiting for college graduates who are bilingual, and of the, I don't know, 1,000 who applied the first round, 500 of them are committed to go work in the Bronx, which is a big shift than what we've done in the past. So the issue is not so much, you know, do we want them? Of course we want them. Is, are they out there? And what do we need to do to get them to work in the schools? And is the licensing requirement the issue around having a master's degree? Um, no, um, it's not. They, they're certified to teach in Texas, but that doesn't give them the right to be able to teach in New York. Is, but is the qualification to be certified in Texas it's, as stringent as it is here in New actually York? Actually, in bilingual education, yes, it is. And the other thing we're also looking at, and we're actually working with the U of T on this, is the extension of certain options in licensing like ESL teachers and other ones. But it's, a lot of it has to do with, with Albany in terms of how they look at the licensing and certification requirements. And thank you, Chancellor. I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Ferreras Copeland. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, we've been joined by Council Members Cornegy and Kalos. And we will hear first from Minority Leader Mario, followed by Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Chancellor. Uh, I just want to go over a few issues. Uh, one of the issues, as you're very much aware of, are we've had a rash of bomb threats in our schools over the last year. Last week, Susan Wagner uh, had another one. And DOE staff uh, has been great. Um, my question is, we met in November with DOE and NYPD, and we came up with a pamphlet for basically a, 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 for the principals to know exactly what to do, delineate writing. I know it's in DOE legal, so my question is just simple. You don't have to have an answer today, but because of the, the bond threat last week, I'd really like to push to get the pamphlet out to the principals for the remainder of this year, because obviously with the these, these bomb threats have been happening mostly in the spring. So if you could follow up or if you have an answer on where we are with DOE legal on approving the pamphlet and if we can disseminate it as quickly as possible to our principals so they know exactly, they just read the pamphlet and know exactly what to do uh, once they get a bomb threat. Yep, and, I, and Staten Island has had a particularly high Thank you. Their rash. So if you could just have your staff follow up, I'd appreciate yep. that. Um, obviously, you and I have had 
uh, numerous discussions on gifted and talented uh, for sixth graders in Staten Island, um, and you've gone on, you know, we've had nine schools, nine elementary schools, and, um, you know, I know we need, we've told you we need a local option, and, and you've had great conversations. Just was wondering where we are with bringing a gifted and talented program to Staten Island. I believe maybe we were talking about uh, maybe one of the intermediate schools like IS-72. If you could just... Uh, well, I think know. one of the things we've been talking about, how do you have not a new school, but a program within an existing right. school? How do you have an honors program? And that is pretty much now being at the superintendent level. Okay. And Ladico is looking at that. And the other thing... That, but, you know, again, I've been to visit a lot of your schools. Staten Island has a lot more hidden gems than people give it credit for. So a lot of what we're trying to do is also what are schools that maybe in the past people kind of didn't look at but should look at, and are, if these programs are there, then how do we enhance them? Right? One of the schools I keep talking about is PS57, um, which I have been really impressed. The only school in the city that's actually going to participate in Soapbox Derby in Akron, Ohio. Um, there are a lot of good things, but then how do we get in her school um, a gifted program? And also in Staten Island, she has the Spalding program, which is also part of the dyslexia effort. And I think it's really important to have parents, and one of the things Anthony and I discuss, how do you have tours of your middle schools? And it could be citywide, but let's be specific in Staten Island. So parents can actually go inside the schools and see some of the great stuff that's happening. Because tours can't take place at night when there are no kids in the building. But certainly working uh, with Anthony and Kevin out there to see which are the right schools to have the follow-up classes, I think that's the way. And I look forward to working with, with you and Anthony on that. Um, and you mentioned this, this Lex here, and you know, obviously we've been talking about this over the last few months, and I know you're uh, having teachers trained for September. Yes. Can you just go into a little bit more detail on how many teachers, is it all the teachers, or is it just some? In, in Staten Island, it's two teachers per every elementary school or more. And two some, teachers per every elementary school? Every elementary school in Staten Island will have a Norton Gillingham trained teacher. And the reason for Staten Island is that it has the highest rate, the, the growing, growing rate of students with autism and other issues. So rather than have specialized classes, our anticipation is that if we can catch the kids early enough, they won't need to be segregated. Because this is not about having kids in a room all by themselves, but how to teach them. And by the way, Orton Gilliam is also known by the name Wilson. So again, if you teach phonics in early grades, foundations, and then with kids who need it more intensely. We just hosted a tour with the borough president yep. at PS57 to see the Spalding program. And we're looking to, at the end of this year, we will be checking the progress. And if that's something that works, we're going to start moving it to more schools. And Spalding, we're working in conjunction with Manhattanville College to train our teachers because it's a unique program, it's very specialized, and it's for the very specific kids. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I look forward to working with you on that. I think uh, in the past, one of the CC meetings, you were talking about District 75 uh, additional school on the radar, if you could just go into, into that a little bit. Well, I think th District 75 has a new superintendent, uh, someone who has spent a lot of time in District 75. He was a para and now he's the superintendent, and one of the things we're discussing with him is how do we integrate District 75 students' programs into the life of, uh, of other schools. It's not to say we're getting rid of District 75. I want to stop the rumor before I even get started. But how do you have two leaders in a building share resources? If there's a District 75 student who's perfectly capable of doing the math curriculum or getting involved in after school programs, that should all come together. So we're looking at all our programs citywide with all the superintendents and say if we can develop models out there that are really good. I was in Queens, uh, the Padavan campus, to see there's a District 75 school in one of the elementary schools. They talk to each other, but they don't do anything together. So how do we get these principals and school leaders to make sure the students are more connected in other Thank ways? You. Um, and, and finally, um, and, I, and I, I really would like to meet offline with you and your staff on, on this. Uh, on, you know, pre-K has been very successful, obviously. Um, what I'm getting in my office, a lot of parents calling about kids who, and we talked about autism, a bit on the spectrum, just trying to get the services. And um, as they get into pre-K, and, and, and they're a little confused about services and teachers. So if we could just meet offline, I have a lot of... Uh, you know, offline questions, and I think it would be helpful uh, for my parents who are just getting into the system. I, I think, you know, for yeah. parents, the DOE doesn't make things easy all the time, but we are trying. And I will give you an example. This past, this month, actually, every borough in the city of New York is having conferences just for special ed parents. In fact, there was one on Saturday, and I met several parents um, 
who had come in and said, unbelievable, all the information we got, the brochures we got. So we are having them. I was at one in Brooklyn, I guess, two weeks ago that they had it at night. And to me, we're going to get as much information out there, and I think also the town hall meetings, you know, maybe adding an extra hour to some town hall on just special needs issues, particularly in Staten Island. But we are trying very hard to get the information out there um, in as many ways as possible. The special ed conferences, I think, can be, I can give all the information to the elected officials about when they take place. And they take place on Saturdays, all day Saturday. The one in Manhattan was this past Saturday. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank, thank you, Council Member. I just want to remind our colleagues we have 13 members in the queue, and I want to give everyone an opportunity at first round. We will have second round, and we will gladly add you to the second round. Um, Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Gibson, followed by Council Member Chin. Good morning, Chancellor. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you for the work that you have done. Uh, if we don't do it under your leadership, it's going to be very difficult for those to do it with other new leaders in the future because as we have said before, you know our city, you, be, you are educated, and also you have the big support of a mayor who really believes in education. Someone that has expanded UPK to all four years old children in our city. It doesn't make it exclusive anymore for a certain New Yorker who live in particular zip code to be the one that they have UPK. So we know and especially as a former chairman of the Higher Education Committee, I always say, we always will be, will be doing better with a good retention in senior community college if we build that pipeline. And we know that it's not that the system is broken, it's that we have built a system that we know that left many New Yorkers behind. Many New Yorkers, we say, in the disadvantaged community is the one that you inherit, that from third to eighth grade, 87% of them, they've been level one and two. It means that, yes, when they go to high school, ninth grade, they are really like a fourth, fifth grade. And many of them, they live in so much disadvantaged community with so much to do in order to close the gap. So, you know, again, like, I appreciate, thanks, you, the mayor, for investing so much in the UPK, on the after school, on computer science, a lot of things to be done. And I always can say at the local level, you've been a good friend, so on and so that has listened to our community. There's items that, you know, continue the conversation. We, I hope that we can keep working from the STEM center to all the programs that we need in the computer. But for me, the most important thing today is that we can say that we are holding this hearing in front of someone with a great background, someone that cares for our children. And I have a few suggestions. One is school public safety. We need more resources. We cannot, we cannot sustain a system providing the safety that we need in our school by increasing the police presence, even though I do believe and appreciate that when we need a police, that we should have police in the school, but we need to provide more funding so that the public school safety division, they should have more men and women power to expand their members in our school. Second, I also suggest that the CBOs, and I brought that suggestion before, in the issue, CBOs which bring quality programs for our schools, they should get a waiver so that they sh would not have to be paid in order to use the space. If those programs that they bring complement the quality education that we need in our school. Something that, as you know, it used to be that way before with the Mayor Bloomberg, it was changed. In the first year, I brought a suggestion. We were supposed to be having conversation, but we had not seen any change in that direction. Then I believe that when it comes to the STEM center, and that's my question, how we, or there are suggestions, but this is my real question, which is, how is the DOE working to create a school with all fields of, that can include all fields of STEM uh, for our students? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me just give you an example of one of the schools in your district that I think could be a model for all. That's Georgia Washington campus. I just spent a morning there last week. Uh, this is a co-located campus, and by the way, I am visiting 
campuses around the city, one in each borough, that's co-located to see how we actually get those schools to share better resources with each other. So I've already done Thomas Jefferson, we did Lehman, unbelievable is going to be a model. Uh, George Washington, I believe I'm going to Vanda Child uh, soon and, and a few others. So how do you get four schools in a building to share the best of what they know and how they have it? And it shouldn't be only for students in that building. And that also goes after school programs. So, for example, one of the schools in the George Washington bit has a wonderful theater arts program, but the other schools don't have Sorry, it. Sorry, Chancellor, but my question isn't about the school sharing the good practice, but my question is about STEM. Yeah, but How can they we... have STEM in each of their schools, and they could share it with each other. When you have STEM that's outside a school building, and it requires traveling to it and seeing separately, it's not integrated into everyday schools. So most of our STEM programs just went to a wonderful STEM event this Saturday, has to be incorporated into the science, ELA, all the things that happen inside the school. But I also want to go back to your CBO issue. CBOs do not pay any permit fees up till 6 o'clock. It's after 6 o'clock that that requires. And that's because in order to hold the building open after 6, custodial charges need to be, char need to be paid. You need to pay security. You don't open a building without a security officer in the building. So those are added expenses, and that's why they pay for the permits. Up until 6 o'clock, they don't pay any extra cost because the principal is still in charge of the building, and the school is expected to, to hold things there. And the school safety officers are all being retrained in very specific ways to de-escalate issues rather to escalate issues. So I think there's a lot of things we're doing simultaneously. I know of the issue that you're referring to now. And I think something also, we need to also bring, make parents more accountable for their kids' behaviors. We need to ask parents, what is it that you're doing to make sure that when your student gets in trouble for something, or does, how do you follow up with that? So I think there's a lot of education that has to take place, but STEM is not a place. It's how you take all the things that happen in the school and bring them together. Um, again, in uh, Staten Island, PS57 has a wing in the school that's a STEM wing, and there's a whole lot of things like, um, you know, again, the, the robotics. These could be school-specific, and all our schools should have things like robotics programs. Thank you, Chancellor. We will now hear from Councilmember Gibson, followed by Councilmember Chin, uh, followed by Councilmember Gorodnik. Thank you very much, Chair Ferreras Copeland and Chair Drum. Good morning, Chancellor, Good morning. to you and your team. Thank you so much um, for all the work you do. Um, I appreciate the extreme advocacy around universal pre-K and all of the initiatives are very ambitious that DOE has undertaken. Um, I want to thank you for your support of school crossing guards. Um, huge fan. Uh, they keep our children safe each and every day, and I know we have a lot more to come. Um, I want to thank you for your partnership around the school leadership climate team and looking at reducing and as much as we can eliminating the pipeline to prison and making sure that we look at alternative measures for many students of color that have traditionally faced a lot of harsh penalties around suspension, summons, and arrests. So I wanted to find out if there is an update you could provide for us on the school leadership climate team and any recommendations that have come out of the team as it relates to metal detectors. Uh, we've talked a little bit about restorative justice. Is there anything you could provide to us as far as an update that's going on? Do you want me to just take it in general? Yeah. Um, well, this is obviously something that we're still discussing. We certainly right. expect to come out with it. So we need to make sure, before we put out edicts, I'm not a big fan of mandates. We need to make sure that all the people involved buy into it so that they'll want to do it willingly, not because we say you must. So obviously there are a lot of interest in this particular initiative, mm -hmm. um, from principals to teachers to, right. to parents. So we want to make sure we have all the discussions we need so when it, it gets rolled out, it's unanimously embraced okay. and unanimously enforced. So it's not that we forgot, believe me, we talk about it all the time, but how do we bring everyone to the table and say, oh, absolutely, this is what we need to do. Okay, great. And you know, I love to remind you as well. Um, students in temporary housing you talked a little bit about. I represent all of District 9 in the Bronx. Um, I know there's a lot of work being done around that. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for the additional bus routes so children do not have to sit on a bus for hours to get to school, as well as the literacy program, social workers, and new technology that we are working with many of our shelter providers. So I wanted to find out, is there an update you could give us? And certainly am working with all of you since District 9 is most of my community and unfortunately faces a high distinction of students in, in temporary housing. 
Yeah, and you're particularly fortunate to have uh, a phenomenal superintendent who makes this one of her top. Of course, she's awesome. Yeah, she's very awesome. Um, Leticia has certainly been on top of all these issues. I think the most important thing is that we can talk all we want about temporary housing and shelters, and if you don't put money behind it, it's just worthless. So we have put a lot of money behind it in this coming budget time. But one of the things I should let you know that in all our, the majority of our shelters, I say, there will be mental health workers. There are now libraries in the partnership with the Scholastic. We put libraries into these centers. We have homework helpers. We have tutors for the students that need it. Um, to the degree possible, creating a home type environment right. in all our renewal schools, and again, District 9 has the most renewal schools, mm -hmm. we put extra support in District 9 to make sure that the students in the renewal schools who are also in, in temporary housing have the extra support they need when they leave school, because remember, many of them are in school to 5 or 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. get the support they need. And the other piece, and this is something that hadn't been done in the past, how do you have parent workshops in the shelters themselves? How do you tell parents, because one of the things we discovered in the beginning of this year, which I didn't know, is that you know, when you look at renewal schools by and large, and thank God now we've improved on that, chronic absenteeism was one of the commonalities. And then we found out that if students were allowed to leave the shelters and they weren't their own, some of them didn't show up in school. So how do we make sure, we have an app now that lets parents know when their students didn't show up, particularly in high school and middle okay. school. So the chronic absenteeism was the first thing we had to, uh, to break down. Second thing is make sure they come to school on a regular basis, number two. And then that parents understand their obligation in making sure that students understand the value of education. So it's a whole group, and I think the work that we're doing, and particularly, like I said, in District 9, because it has the highest concentration, okay. um, that we're doing all we can do to make sure those students are successful. Okay, great. And my final two questions, I wanted to ask more about mental health and the investments are very key. Uh, I'm a huge fan of school-based health centers, which I have across District 9. Uh, suicide prevention counselors, we're finding more children are suicidal and just attempting suicide because of a multitude of issues. Um, what are your thoughts about suicide prevention counselors? And I also wanted to ask about single shepherd, which I think is great, but it's only in District 7 and 23. So I'm hoping that eventually, as we expand, District 9 can be a beneficiary of some of single shepherd as well. Now let me take the second question first. Because of so many initiatives, we wanted to make sure that we could monitor and evaluate the ones we're doing. So okay. because um, District 9 was already going to be getting the second grade literacy, we didn't want to overwhelm them because it's okay. all about more okay. bodies in a school and more things for principals to do. But I think in terms of suicide, it is one of the things that's always on my mind because it's a national epidemic. Actually, it's international. But just to have counselors for that alone, most of our kids don't talk about it. It's not something you can say, okay, you're a typical person who might go in that direction. So I think having wellness centers, a prime example in the Bronx is one of the schools that's working very closely with Montefiore Hospital on just wellness. How do you talk to kids about wellness, particularly high school kids? How do you look at the pressures they're under? Uh, and the pressures for kids are, in some neighborhoods, are, you know, am I going to get into the right college? And other neighborhoods are, am I going to get into college at all? So how do we have broader programs and certainly under our, under Elizabeth Rose, who has our student support services, we're looking to expand the programs under that to okay. do more wellness type discussions with our students. And Great. Support. And we have one at PS55. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to be on for the second round as well. Thank and thank you, you Chair Council Member. We'll have Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Grudenchik, as I said the first time, Council Member King, and Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Chancellor. Um, in your testimony, you talked about um, expanding the dual language program. So it's really exciting that next, this coming year, you're almost going to double. Um, you're going to add another 36. Um, but I didn't really see in the budget, like, are the schools getting uh, additional support for the teachers for the program? So it's not just starting a program, but right. getting the resources that uh, to help them be successful. Absolutely. Um, the reason you don't see it per se in the budget is that a lot of these programs will be funded with Title I, Title II, and Title III monies under our Division of English Language Learners. So the, a lot of the money is there already. Again, I said the challenge is to find the right teachers and teachers who 
um, you know, teaching a dual language program means you have to speak your second language academically. A lot of people speak Ch Mandarin Chinese or Spanish, but they can't teach a subject in those languages. So our hope is also to work with our city universities and graduate more second language learners who can then become teachers in the second language. One of the best schools I've gone to see with dual language is the um, the World Language and Asian Studies program. And I, I in my district. In your district, and it's a phenomenal program. A little under, um, people don't know about it, and I think we should make it more famous. But I asked him in terms of the principal what he would do, because I'm hoping a lot of the students that graduated those programs will then come back and become teachers in dual language. So we understand that's a challenge, but that's not going to stop us from developing the programs, because I do think speaking two languages is a major asset, and the more people who can do it, the better. Well, they're going to be our future bilingual teachers, our bilingual counselors, so we need to solve our own problem of not having enough. Well, I think uh, one of the things teachers. we ask some of our schools to do, particularly high schools, is to have uh, a future teachers club of students who speak two languages to start talking about becoming teachers earlier rather than later. Because again, if you speak two languages now, you're very employable, so you might be tempted to, you know, get higher paying jobs, but there's nothing like teaching. Now, also, when you talked about um, the fair student funding, you talk about um, that increase the, the weight um, for the English language learner and students with interrupted formal education. What does that translate into in terms of funding? And how many of the schools uh, will receive additional funding to get to what you were uh, talking about, 80% uh, of their budget? And also, how do we... Um, what other school will be operating at 100% besides the renewal school? And also, how much additional funding do we need to make sure that every school is operating at 100% of fair Well, I'm going to lay, let Ray Orlando answer, but I will tell you that in terms of, you know, Part 154, we have put a lot more money into school budgets so they can actually do what's right for bilingual kids. Hi, Ray Orlando, Chief Financial Officer. Um, the, uh, um, we would require approximately seven, it would have required $700 million this year to bring all schools to 100% of fair student funding. If we could 73? work backwards, $700 oh, million 700. Dollars would oh, okay. have been required um, to bring all schools to 100%. Without the CFE money from the state, uh, as the Chancellor pointed out, we're $2 billion short of where we should be. We're unable to bring all schools to 100 at this time. However, uh, we are bringing all the, all the floor up from 82% this year to 87%. That will result in additional resources for over 640 schools. Uh, that cost of that is approximately $125, $130 million. Uh, that is coming to us from the additional state aid that we did get this year. Um, if the state were to continue to give us uh, additional state aid at this kind of at this level going forward, um, we would eventually catch up to the $700 million we would need to bring all schools to 100 sometime over the next couple of years, maybe by 2020, 2021, 2022, depending on how the numbers shake out. Um, so uh, we are very glad that we're able to bring the, uh, the, school, the floor up from 82 to 87. We think that's going to result in a lot more money for schools. Uh, the average system-wide will go up to 91%, which is great. Um, and uh, we think that uh, the, the mayor's executive budget is, is a really good news budget for schools. Because in your testimony, you're, you're talking about 160. Um, yes, the other funding uh, is for the SIFE weights, uh, is the funding that's associated with the DELS weights and the SIFE weights. We created uh, three new weights this year in the formula. Uh, the first weights we created were for English language learners. Uh, those weights are for uh, the services that the Chancellor mentioned under CR 154, which require us to provide services to English language learners uh, for two years following their determination of proficiency. Uh, these funds are commanding weights, is what we call them, and they're going to, the funding follows the student, so any school that has an L in it will receive this funding. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilman. Thank you. Good morning, Chancellor. It's so good to see you, and thank you for uh, your inspired leadership. Uh, I have been touring all my schools in, in the almost six months since I took office, and I've been very, very happy with what I've seen, um, District 26 and District 29. So I'll put that right up front. A um, couple of quick things off the top. Um, 
you mentioned the Padavan campus before, I believe. I think I heard that. We have the most beautiful new playing fields probably anywhere. I'm going to say that. It's the best in the country. It needs a bathroom. I've already gotten reports. It's funny a little bit, but it's not so funny because um, some students don't want to walk the 15-minute round trip to the schools and, um, I put this delicately, have been taking advantage of um, places they probably shouldn't be. So uh, I have spoken to the School Construction Authority, Lorraine Grillo, about that, but I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but before I took office, um, the delegation from Queens sent you a letter about Lifeline, which operates one of the branches of PS23 in my district. I have three of them. We have the main branch, which is across the street from the, the Padavan campus. We have Lifeline, which is at the corner of Winchester and Union. And they are, for all intents and purposes, a New York City public school. They have public school teachers. They get the food uh, delivered every day. But they are short on light and power, about $175,000 a year. And um, we are spending almost $30 billion now. I don't, I don't need an answer right now, but I'd ask that you'd get back to me. Um, they provide support services, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses. They have a beautiful little campus there, um, which only they can operate. Otherwise, it would revert back to the state of New York. So um, I really love that school, and um, it takes children from all over Eastern Queens. So I would ask that we can get an answer on that. Now, the last thing I'm going to bring up, because my time is slipping away in my first round, is about the co-location at uh, Middle School IS-109. Um, I was out there this morning again with Senator Comrie. Um, I have to tell you, uh, I was very disappointed about the way I found out about this. I got a single phone call. There was no input from uh, anybody uh, in the community. We were not asked if we liked the location, if we could find a better location. Um, and so I would ask, I know the vote is this week. Um, we, we pushed back the vote and we're still continuing. We're making news here this morning, that's good. No. We pushed it back once. You so yes, we, did, pushed we, pushed it back it, we pushed it back once. We're continuing to have discussions internally, um, but we have heard a lot of community feedback, um, which is the rationale why we pushed it back the first time. Okay. Um, we have like we'll almost 1,500 signatures against this location. I had Lorraine Grillo who will be here later. I had her out to the school. Um, on Friday with Senator Comrie. It is tied for the oldest school in my district. It's going to be 90 years old uh, this summer. It is not in great physical shape. A lot of little problems. Um, we need a new uh, science lab, which she assured me will begin construction this fall. Um, but there's a lot of little things, and I guess she'll be talking to school facilities. She was not very happy at what she saw. Um, I want to thank you also. I don't have any questions. I'm, 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 I'm not taking answers this morning, not yet anyway. I want to thank you also um, for sending out Mr. Whitland. I met with him on Friday at uh, Martin Van Buren. And uh, so we're going to think some more. And hopefully you had mentioned to me when we met uh, at the uh, student voting press conference that uh, they needed one more good program there. So we're going to try to do that. And um, I... I think, I don't want to take too much time, but I do have uh, more questions, but I, I am very interested, obviously, in 109, and Van Buren um, is the one school. I know um, the principal there, in full disclosure, I, he sat down next to me in the fourth grade and I haven't been able to get rid of him since, <laughs> but, um, and he's working very hard and his team is working hard, and we have seen um, tremendous improvements in that school, and he really has won the confidence of the community, which uh, the previous principal did not have it all. So, and also, the commissioner was there last week. She was there last week, and, and uh, she apparently is coming back in September, I'm told. So, well, we always give Sam some homework to do between okay. visits, so, and he tends to rise to the occasion when he knows people are coming. So I think that's really great. But having another CT program, particularly with the hospital nearby, would be, to me, a no-brainer. So continue to work with John on that. I, I certainly will. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hey, thank you, uh, Councilmember Gudenchik, and I do want to uh, reiterate my support as well for the Lifeline issue, and I know that that has also been a problem or an issue for the Queens delegation, so we would like to come to some type of a solution on that school as well. We'll bring that up later on. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, uh, next is uh, Councilmember King, followed by Councilmember Rose, and then Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we've been joined by Councilmember Lander and Van Bremer. 
Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's always a delight, and I just want to say thank you for all you've been doing to help improve the education system for our children, so thank you again. I have four questions for you. Um, I'll jump right in. The first one, I was reading the briefing that we received from the Finance Committee, and thank you all, Finance, for the briefing. Um, I just want to know if, um, for the budget regards to full-time pedagogical and full-time non-pedagogical, I'm seeing the numbers are from, from 2016 go from 115 to 116, but I just want to know what employees fit into full-time pedagogical and non-pedagogical, because I see we have full-time civilian, full-time employees. So I just want to know who fits in those different categories. Well, pedagogical are generally classroom teachers, teachers who have licenses to teach. Um, and then non-pedagogical would be people like school secretaries, school aides, yeah. and a variety of support staff. So pedagogical is in the classroom working directly with kids, and non-pedagogical is supports in every school building or at the district offices. Thank you for that first piece of education. So for my clarification also, so part-time pedagogical would be F-status employees? Yes, they're substitute teachers, which okay. we, we actually put in payrolls from the very beginning. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. My um, second question is, you know that I've always been a strong advocate for athletics in the schools. Um, I know this year, the school athletic, uh, small schools athletic league, you, we've put funding in it. Want to know what does it look like for the coming year? Have we increased the budget? How many more new students or schools will be participating in sports? Yeah, actually, forward. we have increased considerably. So this past year, it was uh, 200. And then over the next four years, we plan on adding nearly 500 teams. Um, and so by the end of the 2019-2020 school year, so 500 teams between now and 2020. Thank you. Sometime in the future, is it possible if I can get a copy or breakdown of the sports that, yeah. whether they're new sports or they're just yep. building on existing sports? I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, my third question is, um, there's been talk of consolidation of schools throughout the school. I want to know, um, could you tell me what kind of savings do you look to come out of the consolidation of schools and how would those savings be utilized in the future? Okay, well, first of all, I want to say the mergers and consolidations are not so much about saving money, although obviously we hope it will. It's about saving resources. If you have a school with 100 students, 150 students, and we have quite a number of those, they have a principal, an assistant principal, often a secretary. That's overhead. Yeah. Um, so as we start looking throughout the city, and it's not about anyone losing their job, but how might they be better used in another place? The other thing for me, which is a major reason for mergers and consolidation, students don't have good resources. You're, you want to do sports. You can't do sports in a school with 100 some odd kids. So if you have three or two or three mergers, and now all of a sudden you have a school of 300, which is a very nice sized school, but you only have one principal, one assistant principal, one school secretary, that money goes back into classrooms. But also, hopefully, those students will have more after school programs, more election, electives. One of the schools that we merged actually recently, those students for the first time are able to take honors classes. Together, the school couldn't do it. With two schools together, they went from 100 and something and 200 and something to a school about 350 students. And that's a good number to provide all the services. So I think that's part of it. So mergers and consolidations are done very carefully. They will be done with community input. I mean, part of this is that we require a certain amount of open meetings. We require the PTAs and the SLTs to be involved. Um, right now, I'm meeting with all the superintendents to get from them the schools they recommend. And my questions are always, you know, do you think this is going to be a problem? Do you think the parents are going to be on board for this? Also, generally, although not always, we look for mergers and consolidations that are in the same building. So it's not a major shift for kids to figure out they have to go somewhere else. And I think also one of the things that we're looking at is in some cases truncations. For example, if a school is K to eight, but in six, seven, eight, they only have 50 kids, which actually is the case. They, they are middle, the elementary school is, has three classes on a grade. And by the time they get to middle school, they have one class on a grade. Right. You can't have certified science teachers, math teachers, and whatever. So we're doing it on a school-by-school -school basis, and the money is expected to go back to the schools within that existing district. So it's a, we're having conversations. But again, nothing will happen um, without a lot of discussion. Okay, thank you. And my final question, um, you've recently, as we all recently heard, New York City had the largest gang takedown 
um, about two weeks ago. It was in my, a part of it was in my district. Now, a number of those young people who were taken down were teenagers as well. So I know there's a gang prevention unit in the schools. I'd like to know how, how are they being, are they successful so far? How are they actually being run? How are they engaging? Is there a, what is the culture for them engaging members who are in gangs who still go to school? Well, I think there's two different approaches. We have what we call SAPIS workers that are specifically trained to work in any school that has large gang activity. The second thing is that we have an NYPD program. I mean, one of the ones I know of, and I was just part of some of the training, was at Lehman High School, where they were having some issues. And the idea is to make sure they're working hand in hand with the principals. You can't have the principal have the kids all day, everything goes okay in the school, and then at dismissal time, something else happens. Mm. So it's how do you have a continuum of experiences and training for everyone, but this is something that in schools where um, there is a known problem, where we engage NYPD, we've been working a lot more closely with them in the last two years. And for example, I don't know how many of you know, but this, this week, we have team up? Yeah. This week, we're starting the first ever team up day where police officers from certain precincts and principals together work with kids in schools. I, I, Bratton and I are gonna be visiting a school. We're gonna be doing read aloud. We need to bring that together so that we can do a lot of more, more preventive work rather than do it at the other end. But it is a problem and it's one that we're seriously trying to, to work on. I thank you and I'd like- And I also think that the forum I was just at, at your, uh, in your district, is the kind of forum as more people should do. I mean, I, I was impressed by the people, you had police officers on the stage, you had educators on the stage, you had a very rich entrepreneurial CO, yeah. and then you have students in the audience listening to what their life could be if they were really engaged in this. And I thought the um, students from your district who questioned the police officers got some really honest answers, and I think it's a mutual response. So I, you know, I certainly encourage more elected officials to run those kind of forums, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, thank you, and I'll talk to you again. I've got some other suggestions that might be of assistance. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rose, followed by Miller and then Levine. Good morning, Chancellor. Um, I, I want to start off uh, my remarks with a, a big thank you. Um, as you know, we cut the ribbon mm -hmm. on the electrical engineering um, program at uh, McKee High School. Um, you know, and that's, that's truly a tribute to, um, and, and it's a culmination of a collaboration between the waterfront, the maritime industries, EDC, um, my office, and DOE. And um, it shows how um, collaboration and a good idea actually, you know, works. So I, I want to thank you about that, and I'm excited to see that an additional $17.6 million has been um, put in the budget to create 40 new career and tech, you know, um, programs. Um, and I'm sure, and I'm looking forward to our offline conversation because I'm sure that my school's one of those. <laughs> um, and so I, I want to ask you about the specialized test um, and the fact that um, not a, no, a large number of students on Staten Island seem to be taking advantage of it. And I, I wanted to know, um, I've been told that it's, it hasn't really been promoted and um, that the, the notice of the test have been lacking. So could you um, tell me how are the students informed? How could we promote this better? And, um, and I wanna talk to you about the DREAM program. Um, well, I certainly look into it because we have to make sure that it is promoted. And like I said, now that you have one superintendent, I think that information can get out there quicker. I also want to say that one of the things that I was very impressed with, and again, you know, when you get a good idea in one part of the city, we should replicate in other parts, that I did go to speak to the Staten Island Advanced Editorial Board, and one of the things they agreed to do to highlight a different school every Sunday in their paper, and I'd like to And they started other, last yeah. Sunday. And I, I think, again, for many of you who have influence with your local newspapers, asking them to do that, particularly for the hidden gems, but I'm sure the Staten Island Advance would be willing to run a full page, and if we could work with them to get something in there when the tests come up. In terms of the DREAM program, we will be expanding that. I want to be clear about the DREAM program, though, because I did just do this actually in District 29, 
and the people in the audience were looking at, how do we get more of our kids to take the test? The program is there. However, parents have to send their students to it. They, has to, they have to give up an afternoon a week where they go to school till 6 o'clock, and they have to go on Saturdays. And for parents to say, well, you know, they don't want to go to school on Saturday, you have to sacrifice something to get something. So I think it has to be a combination of both, but we are certainly happy to um, get more promotions out there, however you want to do it. Maybe put a pamphlet out on what is the dream program yep. and send it out to all of you so you can promote it within your districts. But it, to me, it's always amazing how we provide these programs and then who shows up or doesn't. So, you know. So every school has access to the dream program? They have access, not all in their own schools. There are certain sites, but there's one within every district that kids can go to, but they have to get there. And they have to go there after school, uh, and they have to go there on Saturdays. And it's, not, it's more than a one-year commitment. This doesn't start in eighth grade. It starts in sixth grade. So it's three years of extra time on task, getting the things you need, like the vocabulary development. I think what's also going to help us a lot is that putting algebra and making sure it's in every single middle school is going to make a big difference also, because we know that in taking these exams, that knowledge of algebra is one of the things that makes a difference if you have it or you don't have it. And how many students does this $50,000 uh, commitment um, plan to you know that? Uh, reach? No, I think we're going to have to get back to you on the, the how many students it will reach. The investment that we make. Yeah. Um, how many people are currently engaged in the program? Um, it's over, I know it's over a thousand. I can't give you the exact number. I just went to one of their events, but we'll get you those numbers. So this will um, increase that number? Or yeah, and also, it? and the recruiting. I mean, it's a matter of recruiting. And keep in mind also that middle schools, as of last year, all have after school programs. And we asked all our middle schools to make sure that at least one of the after school programs is an academic one. And many of the after school programs are also geared to help the kids with test prep. So I just went to visit one in Queens, um, Cypress Hills Community Center 171, where she does a lot of her after school programs in a very high need area to prepare the kids for select schools, not just you know the big three, but all of them. And she has a very good track record working with one of her community organiza based organizations. Okay, thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. If you'd like, we can add you to the second round. Councilmember Miller, followed by Councilmember Levine, followed by Councilmember Deutsch. Good morning, and thank you to my co-chairs. Uh, good morning, Chancellor, you and your team. Um, I want to kind of piggyback on uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Grinchik, and the uh, school location. Most of my children attend 109 as well. Um, not necessarily the specifics of it, but just policy as to um, how that occurs uh, in terms of co-location, getting that information out. I know that uh, that was asked. Now, what I would ask is that we be given the information sometime in the future as to what the criteria is, whether it's classroom space and whether or not the community has the same access to that classroom space so that they can then provide additional programming um, I know they're looking, we, I actually did a uh, additional lab in that school, so each time it appears that we have, in any school, additional um, space, it becomes co-located, so we want to kind of figure that one out. And I know you also said that you were visiting some of the co-located schools. Um, what I would also like to know in terms of um, any supporting data around co-located schools where high schools are located in the same building as middle schools or elementary schools. Where I have two in my district that kind of, and, and in my experience I have seen that they have not necessarily been able to duplicate the high school experience with whether it's sports clubs, it's teams, as, as well as going being in the same building with your younger sibling. And so what we have seen is a fall off from K through eight, and then the high school, they kind of get disinterested. How are we addressing that? So that's my co-location riff. Um, last week at Stated, we had the pleasure of welcoming and uh, rewarding IS-192 of Hollis, Queens. They were the regional robotic champions, yep. and they, they just... Um, they just competed internationally. Right. We're very, very proud of them. Happens to be one of those schools that that's um, 
a few years back, no one wanted to send their children to, but I think that we, we no longer have those, and in, 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 I know we don't have them in, in 28 and 29, and I suspect they don't exist within the city any longer, schools that, it's just the narrative. And so um, I would hope that we can do a better job in getting out really what's really happening and going on in our schools, the really uh, vital education that, that's going on there. Um, so, but one of the things that came out that when they competed internationally, they were being supported, uh, corporate foundations through the state or even their, through their countries. And, and 192 kind of was really makeshift in that they weren't, they didn't have a program. It was a teacher, coach, volunteering, parents. And, and so we would like to, as we um, address our STEM issues, how committed are we to these type of programs? Uh, can we look forward to additional resources, not just for 192, but other children so that they compete, can compete? Uh, well, I think that, that um, a lot of people don't know, and we're working on it um, now with our communications department. One of the things we're going to be doing a lot of in the next couple of weeks is talking about celebrations. We have sent teams, we have sent a chess team, the soapbox derby team, the robotics team, all over this country because we are finalists, if not winners, in almost every single competition that we enter. And one of the things that we've said, um, obviously a lot of these are sponsored. I just went to the robotics finality at Jacob Javits. Right. And we have a lot of schools that compete with sponsorship from their own schools. When schools do go outside the city, if they need a certain amount of funding, we have a special fund at the DOE that helps do it. We don't pay for the whole thing, but if they have raised money on their own, you know, doing, you know, all kinds of in-school activities, we try to match some of those funds. We just mm -hmm. did it for some of the other organizations. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. We have to celebrate what's working. And in terms of STEM, there are so many competitions. There's a Maker Fair. There's all Fab Lab. There's all kinds of events that are taking place now where we're way ahead. We just had an event the teachers and administrators, 400 people came during their vacation time to actually learn more on how to do this. So I think we need to be um, a little bit more celebratory about the work we're doing, but very proud of 192. They were actually at City Hall, I yep. think, to get some of uh, the accolades they well deserve. But in every single part of STEM, there are wonderful things happening around and, the city. And so finally, um, I know in other school districts, and sm obviously smaller school districts throughout the state and, and, and throughout the eastern region, um, parents have online access, real-time access to school activities, what their children are doing, what the curriculum looks like, what the homework is done, and all those things there. How close are we to be seeing that here in the, in the local DOE? From your lips to God's ears. I'd say we are more, we're closer on a school-by-school -school basis. There are many high, middle schools and high schools that already have this availability, depending on the expertise within their own buildings to get it. In fact, I just visited two schools that are doing this on very high level. So the idea is how do we get those schools to share what they do and how they do it with others. But I would say um, this is obviously not going to happen, certainly not in the next year. But it's a good idea. Thank you, Council Member. We will now have Council Member Levine, followed by Council Member uh, Rosenthal followed by Council Member Cornegy. We've been joined by Council Member Levine, Barron, Maisel, and Traeger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Chancellor. Always great to see you. You and I share a passion for dual language programs. Uh, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your support of this initiative, which I think is critical to fostering the kind of bilingualism that kids need today in a global economy. Um, I want to thank you not only for your rhetoric in support of this, but for uh, the facts on the ground that you've created in expanding the number of programs. Uh, I think you're adding 36 more for the coming fall, which is That's great fine. news. Um, can you tell us what the total number of students enrolled in dual language programs is now or will be next year? I, I don't have a number of students, but I will tell you that as these programs have grown, the number of languages have grown. So, for example, there is a uh, possibility of an Albanian dual language coming up. And again, the key here is do you have enough students to put in a class with students who are only monolingual? Are parents willing to do that? We have Polish, we have Russian, we have Hebrew. Uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish are obviously the two most popular. We have Japanese this year is going into its second year. 
So I think the interesting thing is not only how many programs, but how diverse the programs are and the challenges. The challenges, once again, many of the embassies have now contacted us and say, how can we help? How can we get you the people who we know in our communities who want to become teachers? Here again, that reciprocal teaching. If you have a license to teach in another language, why can't we give you a license here? And that's been particularly true in the Asian community. We spoke at the Asia Society, and a lot of the people there were saying, well, I was a teacher in my country. Why can't I teach here? So there's a lot of challenges with it, but that's not going to stop us from moving forward on this. Great. Um, great news. Um, could I follow up with your office later to try and get the total number of current yeah. enrollees? Okay, we'll great. Look at that. Um, what's the budget impact of dual language programs? Do they cost more? Do you have a separate budget line for that? Or if they cost more, what's that expense going toward? Well, they cost more in the sense that they need two teachers. I mean, there's two ways of doing dual language. Um, in the high schools, I'm, I'm going back to world language, it's one teacher who speaks both languages teaching chemistry, for example. But in elementary school, it's parallel teaching where the teacher who does um, English is doing English, and then the teacher who speaks the other language is doing the other language. In some schools, they choose one person doing both languages. But usually after elementary school, that model in and of itself doesn't work that well. So that's an expense. I think of it as an investment, not an expense. If this is something that's going to help students you know, graduate, many more colleges, now, you know, for a while there, colleges had eliminated their foreign language uh, requirements. Many more are now putting it back. We're also looking to institute a um, distinguished diploma at the end of high school. We're now See, also when you have dual language in elementary school, you need to make sure that then you have a feeder pattern to middle school. And now that we have them in middle school, we want a feeder pattern to high school. This year, we started three high schools that have dual language programs. And our expectation is that we're going to have to do more of that because parents have a right to say, well, they started an element, why can't we continue? So every time we have a good idea, there are new challenges. And I think new challenges as long as we're working for the right reason, are worth overcoming. Great. And so for the 36 programs you're opening in the fall, is there, a, is there a budget impact on that? Did you have to add additional money to the budget? Do you know what that would be? I can't give you that answer, but our, my feeling is that most of the money is coming out of. Uh, a portion of this is federal money because the federal government is giving us a lot of our English language learner funds. So we've just decided to spend it this way. So I don't think it's about taking money away from other. So it's not all on the individual school centrally. Oh, absolutely. DOE has I don't know. The we, extra we actually fund most of it, at least the beginning years, from us. Right. Because there are certain things. We want to make sure it's in the right place. The principal in and of herself or himself cannot do this. Because we need a commitment that there's space available in that building. We need a commitment that the right number of students. There's a ratio of how many students speak Japanese versus speak English. And also, we are totally accountable for the teacher professional development. And starting last year, we insist that the principals come along with the teachers. Because if you don't have the principals who are committed to these programs, then the teachers may not be able to do what they need to do. So it's a combination of many things, and we carry most of the burden, assuming that this is something that's going to work. The other thing is that dual language programs in the past have also increased enrollment. Yep. in schools. And diversity. And diversity yep. and enroll. So we're doing this for a lot of reasons, obviously speaking another language being number one, but if you have a middle school, for example, that's under-enrolled, and there are some of you from districts where that was the initial reason for doing it, we've seen a spike in enrollment in those schools. Could you very quickly exchange, explain how the model programs work? I know my time is up, but you've designated 15 programs as models, is that right? Models are the ones who've taken it most seriously and have increased recruitment to the community as a whole. There are also models who may have tried, if there's space available, to bring in students outside of their catchment areas. And where the teachers are doing an outstanding job. I was just in a program in Queens, in PS16. Those fifth graders presented uh, in writing and in speaking and in song in two languages better than anyone I've seen in a foreign country. So those are model programs where the principal can articulate what they've done and how they've done it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Carnegie, followed by Council Member Kalos, and we've been joined by Council Member Johnson. Thank you so much, Chairs, and thank you um, so much, Chancellor. It's great to see you as always. And thanks so much for a successful Student Voter Registration Day. Um, we registered over 8,500 kids, and I know you're um, 
uh, working on the next one already, so I really appreciate that effort. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, a lot of people have been asking you about um, funding for the incredibly important programs that you do. I'm going to switch a little bit over to the revenue side just to make sure that we're getting in all the revenue the city could be getting um, to pay for these incredibly important programs. Uh, I'd like to ask you about two. One was, um, uh, to, as a follow-up, to Council Member Drum asked you for the E-rate revenue increases, um, but in the answer, what I heard was um, savings of 38 million that were attributable to things other than the E-rate. Is there uh, any uh, a figure increase or not? Is there a figure in the budget for uh, expected revenue from E-rate for fiscal year uh, 17? Okay. So um, we are in the E-rate funding period right now in terms of turning in our application and working on that right now. Um, so we are hopeful um, to receive funding from the SEC for E-rate. And do you have an expected amount for fiscal year 17? It doesn't go to our budget. It's a discount program. So it's Excuse not, me? It doesn't go to our budget. It's a discount program. So in the discount, uh, that would, of course, be you would, of course, in order to calculate uh, your expense, you would include your discount uh, number, right, yep. in order to get a net number? No? Ray's shaking his head. Uh, the way we, the way we, the way uh, the program works, uh, and uh, team, correct me if I get it wrong, uh, is uh, that uh, the uh, we apply for uh, projects that we believe to be eligible uh, to the FCC uh, at what we believe. Right, Ray. You know, I have two minutes left um, in my questions. I guess I, I, understanding the program, not understanding the program. I'm just interested in knowing what the dollar value is, or if you can't give me the dollar value, what percentage of your um, applications do you think you'll get the discounted rate at? However you want to give me the number, I'm just trying to get a number. And if you don't have it, just say you don't have it. We, yeah, we'll get, we'll get you that number. Okay. After. You, after. You yeah. don't have it now? No. Okay. Um, but you are sure that you use something to go into the fiscal 17 budget, or no? Because you don't know yet. We have to get back to her. You have to get back to me. Okay. Last year, you put money in the budget for Chrome notebooks in order to um, uh, increase the ability of your OTs and PTs to bill Medicaid for um, uh, the special ed uh, services that you provide. Did you uh, did that have any any luck with that? Do you did your what's your Medicaid uh, expected? Uh, well, actually, my understanding is for the third year in a row, your expectations for Medicaid revenue for that program have decreased. Um, I'm wondering if the impact, if there was an impact of putting that money in for the um, Chrome. Uh, notebooks, or if instead you've decided to contract out that service, and so okay. the providers are doing that, or you'll get back to me. Uh, hi. Um, so we have uh, provided the OTs and PTs with uh, Chromebooks, as you note. Uh, our expectation is that uh, we will uh, end up billing Medicaid. Uh, this year for more money than we did last year. Uh, the OTs and PTs have improved session entry turnaround time by 50% on average uh, with the Chromebooks. So we think the Chromebooks have helped the OTs and PTs to Great. improve the session entry turnaround time. So in fiscal year 15, what was the revenue you got back in 15, 16 and then your expectation for 17? I just want to be able to note that in my records. Uh, we believe that uh, we'll collect uh, in Medicaid revenue uh, this year, we're hoping to bill for approximately $45 million of services, and last year we billed for approximately $30 million of services. You billed for 30 last year, 45 and this year. And we expect year. to be able to bill by the end of June. We're hoping to bill uh, for 45, yes. 
45 for fiscal year 16. In, 17? Yes, in 16. Uh, 17, does anyone know what the target, I, don't, um, I can get it to you, I just don't know what it is. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the budget, but I just don't, I don't have mm -hmm. the number. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Cornegy, followed by Council Member Kalos, followed by Council Member Lander. Good morning, Chancellor. So um, I, I would like to say that I, I'm grateful, grateful for, um, on behalf of District 16, for the Gifted and Talented program that we anticipate for the fall. Uh, there's some very excited parents, as well as students, as well as legislators, about the possibilities uh, for that program. Um, as part of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, we did cite that my district, along with three or four other districts, were districts who had no gifted and talented programs, and they obviously were in predominantly um, black and Hispanic communities. I wanted to know if there's a move on behalf of the DOE to um, bring those same services to those particular districts as, as was done in mine. Yes, all four districts are getting the same program. Again, as I said before, the major difference is that this was going to start in third grade, which allows, and I met with your CEC several times actually, um, to explain to them why I thought this was a better way to go. The other uh, thing is also that it will have multiple measures and all your second graders so that parents don't have to look for it. All second graders will be eligible to um, apply for this um, particular program. And also that they will eventually be able to go from third, fourth, and fifth grade to a middle school in District 16. And the other thing, that will also continue the honors programs right into the middle school. So we met with a lot of your parents. I think also you have a superintendent who's taking this very, very seriously, has already chosen a school and a principal who has had some background in this. And again, the teachers are going to be specifically trained. These are not the same teachers who are working in these schools. These are teachers who are going to go for summer institutes to be able to bring a special curriculum back to those schools. So, Chancellor, I'm glad you mentioned the middle schools because as the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus uh, began to drill a little deeper, what we found was there was um, in some districts where there were elementary schools that had gifted and talented programs, there was no continuum. Uh, so I'm really glad to hear yeah. what you're saying about the junior high schools because uh, with the rate of uh, black and Latino students uh, taking the tests for specialized high schools right. and or admitting, being admitted into specialized high schools, we know that the continuum has to be with junior high school. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're committed uh, to that. Lastly, um, I had hoped that there would have been a budget line perhaps for enrichment for those districts like District 16 who are now getting reintroduced to the Gifted and Talented program to help build capacity within those programs to accept more students. So I can talk to you offline about what that looks yeah, like. Yeah, and I think, you know, you certainly the four superintendents, um, we're having these new programs. Uh, I've also talked about creating what we call the, Renzulli, the enrichment model mm -hmm. in other schools Absolutely. so that the principals feel that they want to compete and want to keep their kids so the kids don't go to another school. But it means that the whole district has to work. And that's part of the reason why we're also um, doing the co-location at one of your schools because by bringing two schools together, the resources will be greater there mm -hmm. for the youth schools in the building. So I, I have high hopes for this, this particular program. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that in, in my district, the whole district band together when we understood that there was an opportunity to do this. So. Um, oh, no. We, and your superintendent wouldn't let me get away with it. So this, that's all well and good. So, but, but we had groups like NSBE, which is the National Society of Black Engineers, right. who came out and committed themselves to tutoring uh, and test prep. But what we realized was just test prep wasn't enough mm -hmm. and that enrichment was the greater model to work through. Right. So we can appreciate. Yeah, and I think whatever the middle school is that we decide to put the program in, having mentors and internships, which is exactly what those groups should be involved in, that would be the middle school to do it. And actually you have several middle school principals, all of which want the program. Jackie being one of them and yep. a few others. So, so thank you again for that. And just lastly, with the renewal schools, I wonder if you could briefly give us a report back on how they're doing, what your expectation is, in particular, Boys and Girls High School. Okay. Um, the renewal schools, we have been working, obviously, very strenuously. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we have done particularly well, I think we eliminated, we lowered the chronic absenteeism. We've increased the attendance. Um, I think also there's been a change of leadership in many of our renewal schools. I think in Boys and Girls High in particular, having a principal who's a master principal working in that building has made a difference. Um, he is 
trying to simultaneously run another school, but I think it's actually worked well because he combines the teachers from both schools so they kind of work off each other. And I know that the commissioner of the 27 schools that are high priority within the renewal school, she has visited a lot of them, continue, will continue to visit more. And she's very impressed with the way we're doing the teacher professional development. So I anticipate seeing great things, but I can certainly give you a written report on the renewal schools by your specific district so you have a better idea of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Kalos, followed by Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Traeger. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. I'd like to talk to you today about school seats, hunger, and civics. Uh, on the topic of school seats, WNYC in 2014 estimated that we had over 2,118 2, four-year-olds in my district. Yeah. At that point, we had 123 pre-K seats. Coming into this year, we only had 425. We've been able to work with uh, Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach on securing an additional 90 seats. What I can tell you is walking each and every provider through the process is painstaking, requires a staffer fully devoted to this and only this, and the process must be better and we have existing providers that somehow still fell through the cracks. We'd like to get that provider into the system so we can get those valuable seats. But that being said, I'm glad we got another 90 seats and we're now up to 515, but that still puts us 1,500 short. I learned recently that my district has fewer UPK seats than anywhere else and there's a lack of transparency around the process and I even had to foil to find out what's going on and I think that that is not uh, in the interest of an administration that has the partnership that w we say we do. So I guess the big piece is will you commit to sharing with us how many people are applying from my council district, how many are getting the seats in my council district, how many people are being sent down here to the World Financial Center uh, and where we're going to have four-year-olds with 45 minute to an hour commutes. Uh, so I'd like to start with there and if you could be quick in your answer, I'd also like to touch on hunger and civics. Well, I know that this is something you've been discussing with Deputy Chancellor Wallach, and I certainly suggest in terms of the specifics that that is where the conversation um, should go. I think in terms of trying to even out the numbers, keep in mind that probably our numbers will not be as formalized until the middle of June because we're waiting for people to reply back. Many parents apply to multiple places. They will apply to private schools. They'll apply to other places. But I am very much aware of the Roosevelt Island situation and we're looking... I, I think Roosevelt Island were set, but oh, I think okay. the issue is if, if you would share with me that I had, that I'm not dealing with the 2,000 number, but I only need 30 or 60 or 100 seats, if you actually told me what the numbers were and told the community, because okay. right now I have parents who are like, we don't know if we should spend 30, 40, 50,000, mortgage our apartment, get our kid into a pre-K, okay. or whether or not there's enough seats because we just rolled out these new 90 seats and they're like, am I one of the lucky people? What are my odds? Is it 36 to 36? And There's that's someone here something that shouldn't have to happen at a Go hearing, ahead. though. Okay. Hi, uh, Claire Totten on behalf of Pre-K. We know we're continuing to work with you to add seats in your district. We still have work to do. We know there are not enough. How many parents applied from Council District 5? The applica application period is still open. It'll close For the first week. period, for the first round. For the first round, it increased by about 150. You had about approximately 26,000 families apply. 2,600. 2,600 fam Correct. families apply. And so we, okay, so, and how many were turned away or put on waiting lists? Absolutely every family got an offer. Chances are most of those families did not get an offer to a seat located close to their district or within. Okay, so to the extent we can really deal with it, that's a lot of families who need seats. The next piece is on hunger. My understanding is for school breakfast and lunch, that is almost fully funded by the federal government. Is that correct? Even to the point where it only costs us uh, even though we may outlay tens of millions, we only end up spending a million or a couple of million on it. Uh, the reimbursement covers about 80% of the cost of the 80%. Yes. So that being said, if 80% of this money is coming from the federal government and every dollar that comes in pays for staff, pays for food, pays for our local economy, can we roll out free lunch uh, to the entire city? Because 1.1 million kids could be eating breakfast and lunch for free and the federal government will pay for it, 80%. We're, we're assessing the possibility. 
if, if you, I want to wake up in a city where every kid has breakfast and lunch, and in terms of the community learning schools, does every community learning school offer supper, supper because President Obama says he'll pay for that too. So we could be waking up in a city where 1.1 million children had three square meals a day. That's one eighth of our city. It would be amazing. Can we, can we do it? You know, it's all a matter of priorities. We have to take it one step at a time. I'm not saying no. I said we'll go back and look at that. Thank you. That would be great. And I guess just last piece, as we're heading into the uh, general election, I know you had concerns last time, uh, but I, I do believe that we do need to have a civil discourse around politics, and if we can work with kids to have it in school, then they'll learn so that they can do it when they get to be adults. And even if they, we have the next president of the United States in our grade schools right now, they might be able to change the dialogue on a national level one day. But we have a civics uh, engagement curriculum. It starts in kindergarten. It's been given out to all the schools. So that is our plan. We have certainly worked on registering high school students to vote. And now we're going to be starting a campaign for, to have discussions in schools about what makes a good leader. So rather than get involved in particular people and personalities, if you were looking for a leader, what would be the qualities, the traits they would have? And having discussions in schools that don't become finger pointing, um, I think is a really important part of the election process. But there is a process in place. It's part of our social studies curriculum and we're certainly encouraging principals to use it in their schools. My, 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 my hypothesis is if we had children doing a mock vote every year from pre-K all the way up through high school, that they would be so much more likely to vote when they turned 18 and would love to have your partnership in that. I think what we've seen in the past uh, in a lot of our mock votes is that depending on the age, if there's no dialogue and no teaching, students just do whatever their parents are doing at home. So I do think the education piece is crucial. You know, what, what is an elected official? What should they be uh, looking at? What are some of the issues that you think should be important? I think discussing some of the issues are really important. Many of our schools are discussing issues like immigration. Certainly it's a fourth grade curriculum, it's a seventh grade curriculum, it's a tenth grade curriculum. So I think discussing the issues is another way to make more enlightened citizens. And I'm happy to share the curriculum as it now exists so you can see it. Um, and I think that's the right way to go. If schools, I am not against them doing mock trials. I'm, all I'm saying is be very careful that it's done in an educational way and it's not done simply as a free for all, like an after school program, but part of the school day. I would okay, love thank to do you, a uh, pilot with you in my schools and any other council members who wish with your support if you agree to that. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Next, do we have Councilmember Lander, followed by Traeger, Barron, Levine, and Johnson. Thank you, Chair Drum. Chancellor, good to see you. I know uh, on this vein of civic engagement, we've spoken about using uh, participatory budgeting and trying to have that be something. We've seen some amazing work in schools and are looking forward to working with you to make that yeah, even And before more you ask, I mean, I'm, I won't take away your time. You get extra. <laughs> I would love to see participatory budget being taught at every, on every high school because I was at actually your event the other day, um, City Council Johnson, and one of the principals said to me, she was there specifically to see if she got some of the money, and one of the things I asked her is, how much did you involve the students in doing the participatory budgeting? And she said, well, it was mostly teachers and parents. We've got to take it, turn it around, and make students part of the process. And, and we've, you know, at uh, the know. John Jay building, we've had that. And at uh, PS230, they run their own whole, PS230 and 107 run their own whole internal uh, process with a little money set aside by the PTA. It's, it's been great. Um, Thanks for all the good things continuing in, in District 15. You know, PS 282 just came back the national chess champions, and I was out there and at PS 32 and, and Park Slope Collegiate for the last couple of days, and great things happening in, in all those places. I want to thank you for uh, the move to blind rankings on the District 15 middle school process. Um, and though this is a budget hearing, so I won't focus on the diversity and integration and segregation issues, we've made a lot of progress over the last year, and I look forward to when we can pick up that uh, conversation about where we're headed next. Uh, but since it's a budget hearing, I'll focus on budget uh, questions. Um, one number that jumped out at me, and I think in a positive way, is the big increase in special ed. Um, uh, and that's special ed programs in our schools. In past years, we've talked about our frustration with how much is going outside the schools. And I take it that this is, uh, you know, a growing number of kids with IEPs, with um, 
you know, uh, diagnoses and programs to help them get what they need. And I wonder, I see there's four different programs. I wonder if you just give us a little more details about are those new programs, you know, the, are those new ASD Nest programs, which you and I, you know, love that we have in uh, quite a few of, are those expansions of existing programs? Just break down a little further if you okay, can well, first how of that all, expansion. The NEST program is very much it's similar to the dual language. Once you start in elementary school, you need to continue in middle school and high school. So expanding those programs so students can have, um, you know, from pre K to 12th grade assistance is part of it. The other um, big thing in special ed also is that we're trying to move away from self contained classrooms to ICT classrooms. And ICT classrooms, um, require two teachers, they require extra support services, and this year in particular, we decided to do a lot more training of teachers who are in ICT classrooms because what we found, when teachers graduate college, they know how to work in a specialist setting, but they don't necessarily know how to work with a partner or with another teacher, so that was another piece of it. We also wanted to make sure that related service providers fit the needs of the IEPs and what does that look like, so that's, that was another growth. And here again, more training in Norton Gillingham, which we think will actually help us uh, decertify because IEPs for all students shouldn't be forever. They should be until you're at the level of proficiency. So there's lots of things we're doing simultaneously, but most importantly, I think an awful lot more engagement with parents about what they can do at home and what are some of the things that when they come to school, uh, they should be able to expect their principals and parents to talk about. So there's a variety of things that are going on, but certainly the NEST program and the uh, ICT expansion uh, have been in a big point of the, the growth in monies. With the ICT expansion, anything that builds on the model of the Brooklyn Children's School, which has D75 and district ICT, or are these all in district ICTs, kids with IEP from that local that district? I would say that it's more of who are the kids in the same classroom, which is not true of the children's model. So this is how do you have, same way you have dual language, you know, what's the proportion? Eight students who have IEPs versus the rest of the class. That's the ICT model that we're using. And keep in mind that when you have two teachers in the classroom, there's also a requirement when one teacher's not there to pay for a sub, it's not leaving one teacher alone with the rest of the kids. So there's a lot of um, special needs the, that we need if we're going to make these robust programs. I think with the NEST program, we also found that when you have all the services that you do for these students, that it means we've hired more school psychologists, more OTs, lots of different things. District 75, uh, I mentioned before, has a new superintendent, and one of the things that we've been saying, we need to find better models of doing more things together, but they have to be in the same building, and they have to be able to figure out how do they use the after-school programs together? How do they share resources? If you have a great speech teacher, um, and that speech teacher is doing mandated, can two schools together maybe pay per session so she can do PD for the teachers? So we've hired more speech teachers. That's a whole other. Um, so we're moving on this in, in lots of different ways. Right. I would just urge another look at the, you know, I do think, and I know it's expensive, but the children's school model where you do ICT with D75 kids and D75 teachers together with district teachers, it's very powerful what happens in that, in that building, and I, you know, I think it would be great to see more of it. I guess what I would just ask, I know we can't do it at this hearing, um, there's some detail in the budget about programmatic expansion and headcount expansion. But if you could give us, uh, to the extent you guys have it, some drill down on which programs and where so that we can really get a good sense of what's we, in the We can definitely get you that. And, and just to give you high level, it's, you know, ASC NEST programs, ASC Horizon, bilingual special education, um, and ACEs. But we'll get you details on the specifics in terms of students and whether they're expansions or growing models. That would be great. Models. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Councilmember Traeger followed by Councilmember Barron. Uh, Thank you to Chairs Drum and Farrars. Thank you for having this hearing. And Welcome, Chancellor. Great, great seeing you uh, over the weekend uh, at the uh, coastal cleanup of Coney Island Creek. It was really, it says a lot to have the Chancellor of New York City uh, there supporting our local schools. And I, I, I think you would agree with me that those are things that uh, are, are, have greater impact than any textbook could have. Absolutely. And, and uh, deepens the learning experience. I appreciate your attendance and support. Uh, Chancellor, just a, a couple of uh, quick, uh, obviously, budgetary questions. Uh, the state is, again, on the verge of mandating another major evaluation overhaul of the evaluation system. Um, this is a, I, I'm speaking like a former teacher and chapter and a delegate, but I, um, I'm just curious, have, have they set aside any funding for professional development and training and implementation 
for yet another evaluation system, or is this another unfunded mandate from Albany? At the moment, it's still in their heads, but I will tell you that we in the city are working with a lot of different constituents, including the teachers union, to see how we might uh, be able to present a plan of our own that might be suitable for this. But um, I think there comes a time when things that you're being asked to do have to be funded because um, obviously they would make it work better. But this is an ongoing discussion with the commissioner and also with Albany in general. And please keep us in the council posted on this because quite frankly, it's just not acceptable uh, just to pass on mandates but not resources to meet the needs of our, of our kids. Um, Chancellor, this is an issue that um, I, I, I've heard about even in my days of teaching and uh, to this day, and there's some confusion, I'd just like to get some clarity. Uh, we were told that October is register month. It's a big, big month with regards to attendance. Uh, but there are uh, a number of school districts, including the ones I represent, that have uh, families that uh, move in from other countries and they enroll their kids because we accept all children. Um, but we hear sometimes complaints or concerns from local schools that once October passes and let's say January, February, new families move in and enroll their kids to the public schools, funding does not follow them. If you could just clarify this issue for me, I greatly appreciate it. Yes. Uh, from my days as a principal, I remember this one well. Uh, registers close October 31st. Any student who's registered in your school up to October 31st becomes your school budget. So every child carries money with them until that. Any child who comes into your school after October 31st is like a blank slate. Um, they don't carry money with them. And what happens in many of our schools in New York City, particularly over the last few years, the immigrant pattern uh, means that they can come any time of the year. And also many of our students then also come in or don't come back to school after Christmas. So you, you'll see in many districts a big lack in school attendance the month of January because they'll go away to their families for the holidays and then don't come back. On the other hand, we don't take money away from them if those students aren't there. So actually, you know, Ray and I have been discussing what is the correct number that we have said, okay, you know, you're not going to move the figures for one or two children, but is there like a class size? If you have 25 children who come into your school after a certain day, is there some flexible monies that can go to those schools? And we've been doing it on a case-by-case -case basis if the numbers are very large, but what we discovered last year when it first came to my attention, particularly in certain parts of Brooklyn and the Bronx, that generally it was a white off, you know, that you, lo you got 30 kids, but you lost, you didn't lose th 30. Um, so the other thing we're looking at is, and many years ago we experimented with allowing kids to be discharged. If you had a plain, you know, ticket that proved many of our students only get one-way tickets because they don't know if they're coming back. So this is an issue and it is something we're very much aware of and we're monitoring parts of the city by parts of the city because it's not an oval, it's not across the city but it's in, um, in places with a large immigrant population. I would say District 20 and 21, it's a major issue. I taught yeah. in, in one school yeah. that had, and we welcome all kids, but we need to be funded for those kids, especially if they need IEPs and other oh, types of resources. Last question, I know time is, is uh, when it comes to, I, I uh, support my schools with a lot of resume capital support uh, technology, but one of the things that we're seeing is that if, if, we, if we help support a school with uh, smart boards or other forms of technology, there are maintenance agreements that these companies like to attach them to their mm -hmm. products, and that is not Reso A eligible, and that becomes a funding issue for the school. Correct. So what support does the DOE provide to those schools that receive major technology grants, especially from members of the council who really love to support technology in schools? Well, there's one thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to get what we call a computer tech line in the DOE budget. And we're actually working with legal and, um, and UFT and a few other people so that if a principal has a large investment in technology, is there a per and some schools are already doing this, but there's no line. So it becomes money that has to be gotten through PTAs and other funds. So we are working on that. And, um, and the other thing is that it really is important that we figure what the maintenance of the future is going to be. Do you have any more? Yeah, it's, but it is, it is a struggle. But I also want to say 
thank you. I mean, all of you give special money to special schools, but in, in your particular case, I think the funding of a school like Dewey, which it has gone from a school that was losing enrollment to one that has, is going to be able to offer, I think, three new incoming classes, is, has a lot to do with the kind of RISO funding that you're doing there and the other things that we're trying to do together. So I would say also putting money in schools and the maintenance agreement is notwithstanding, we need to, we need to keep doing that. Right. We need, because it's, it's going to take all of us to get these schools off up to a certain level. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Barron, followed by Levin and, Levin and Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, part of the issue with children in shelters is that basically it's only $100 that is designated per student through Title I funds, and I understand that there's $10.3 million that the executive budget has for students and shelters. What is the plan for how that money will be utilized? Do you have the answer that way? Okay. Hi, Ray Orlando, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, there are, the $10 million is going to uh, fund uh, 33 positions uh, in a variety of areas. We're going to uh, provide high school enrollment counseling. Uh, we're going to increase social workers uh, at the schools that see the largest numbers of homeless students. Um, we're going to have DOE shelter-based attendance teachers, as the Chancellor has uh, been saying all morning, attendance improvement is key. Um, we're going to look to fund some additional school-based health centers in elementary schools that service uh, large numbers of homeless students. Um, we're also going to invest money in a shelter-based literacy program. What would that be, the shelter-based literacy? Because that's sure. getting a that's going to fund literacy specialists. Say we're, again? That's going to fund literacy specialists. At which shelters? How many shelters? In 35 shelters. I don't know which ones, but I believe that I'm sure we can get that okay, for you. Okay, good. Thank you. In sure. schools that have K-8 to eight grades, what assurance do we have that the teachers in those middle grades are certified to teach this subject area? That is one of the things we're looking at right now. Um, to me, the bigger concern is how many students are there in 6th, 7th, and 8th grades. And that's one of the things I've asked every superintendent to look at. Are those students getting an appropriate middle school education. Are those students prepared for high school? Do we have any idea of what the range, uh, what the percentage might be, especially when we talk about science? Talking Absolutely. About no, I don't have it, but that's one of the things we're looking at because a lot... When do we think we'll be able to know? Keep in mind that a lot of the KDAs were not certified as middle school, so they, the teachers have common branch licenses, right. so they don't need that. But I can, I can get that. Okay. I think that would be important for us to know, especially in the science and the math, uh, how many of those teachers in those schools are actually certified so as we talk about. And, and again, it's not just the teachers certified, but are they providing the right kind of opportunities for these students who then have to go to high school and be able to do certain levels of work? You right. Uh, in terms of uh, co-locations, I see that in your, re your remarks you have that there's a district charter partnership. Could you just give me some more information? How were the schools selected? Suppose the principal does not want to be partnered with a chartered school? No, no. The district um, charter partnership has more to do with professional development. It doesn't right. have to do with co-location. So, for example, District 23, District 19, right. and wanted to work with Uncommon Schools right. as part of the, the principal feedback. So, they so it's just those training sessions that I've been to one or two of those sessions myself. They're usually held on Saturday. Uh, so that's what we're talking about? Yeah, but it's all voluntary. Which are the schools that want to participate? What is okay. it that they want to learn? And how do they want to work okay. together? In terms of uh, co-locations, there's still an issue, which I think I brought to your attention before, about a beautiful pool that's not being utilized during the school day. And it's really uh, unremarkable. It's, it's un unconscionable that it's not being used. So I still would like to find out how we can get that pool to be utilized. It's totally renovated. It's a beautiful pool, and those four principals, and that's a problem with co-locations. It's really a problem when four people are doing each of their programs and not coming together in that regard. And that brings me now to co-location at a, a proposal for co-location of a school in my district, the Langston Hughes School. I'm sure that your staff has been bringing you information about what we see as some of the major issues in that regard in terms of the school is growing, and another 
school coming in would certainly hamper what it is that we want to do. And my understanding is that President Barack Obama has talked about a new program that he wants to bring in, that he wants to offer to schools based on the fact that these schools will in fact have the opportunity to expand what's being done in terms of the arts, sciences. The particular school I'm talking about has a beautiful music program, they have several music classes and art, and we need to make sure that that whole school doesn't suffer, which has so often happened, and that they've been penalized. My time is running quickly. Uh, just two other points. What are we doing so that we can increase the number of black and Latino students attending specialized high schools? We know that there are a limited number of junior high schools that feed into those specialized high schools. What are we doing to make sure that they're getting more than just that summer program? And what are we doing about male recruitment for bringing men into the uh, public school system? Well, first of all, we're expanding our DREAM program. We're just expanding our discovery program. We're going to make sure that the new gifted programs in four districts also continue into middle school with, as honors programs. Um, we are doing major recruitment under my brother's keeper. Uh, keep in mind that it's not just men or women. It's about high quality. We want to make sure that and one of the things that we've been working on, particularly in Staten Island but in other places as well, is working with historically black colleges and getting them to come to a lot of our uh, recruitment areas, particularly we just had a whole college fair. We will ask them to come and speak to our, our high school students. So there's lots of things that we're doing, and I'm happy to share some of the very specifics in terms of as it relates to your particular district. Thank you. And uh, just if I could impose one more question. Is there some place where we can find a plan for how the $28 million is going to be spent for our, is it published, is it online, the plan for how we're going to spend the $28 million? I'm, I'm sorry, $28 million? From the state? On? For the community school for the community project? School. Okay, sorry, I wanted to clarify. Um, what we're doing right now is we um, are taking a look at our current community school programs and assessing if the state funding is going to support some of those that uh, have either lost funding or where we want to expand current programs within our current community school programs. So it'll be published when it's finished, the plan? Sorry, one second. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. And again, I think if any of you want to visit a school outside of your own district to see what a community school might, because now we have model schools that we've chosen, both community schools that are models, learning partner schools that are models. We have models for almost anything you can imagine. We have model renewal schools. So um, any schools that you want to visit to see in practices, some of the things we're talking about, I'm happy um, to arrange for you to do that. And Councilwoman, I think what we should do actually is have a conversation with you about our strategic plan around community schools and how our fund, both the city tax levy dollars have put into community schools and state so that we could talk about, you know, what it currently looks like and what our plans are moving forward. Thank I think you. it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Chancellor. I want to thank you for uh, coming on Saturday to our uh, West Side Summit on the High Line. I think you were the big hit. Well, you know, I think people think I must, ne I'm old I hat. must never be home, um, but I've actually enjoyed my Saturday events because I get to meet your constituents and also hear what you're doing, so it was great. And there were a lot of parents and young people there as well, so it was great to have you there. I know that Chair Ferreris Copeland asked about this at the beginning, but if you could just walk me through, if there is a, a gender nonconforming, transgender, a uh, student uh, who is either in uh, an elementary school, a middle school, or a high school. They self-identify a certain way. Uh, you could say that there's a young transgender girl who identifies as a girl and wants to use uh, the restroom that she identifies with, which is the, the girl's room. Uh, does every principal and superintendent and school sort of know how to handle a situation like that? And are they given guidance and guidelines? This is a work in progress. Um, our anticipation is that they will all be given guidance. Uh, what we've been doing right now as principals email me or email their superintendents and say, I have this particular situation in my school. We've been reaching out directly to those communities. 
What we've been advising principals to do is to start with um, parent meetings, to talk to parents, let parents talk about what their concerns are and also what the issues are. We've been working with the Ackerman Institute, which is one of the institutes that has some experience in this, to get a real um, outlook on what is the best ways to approach this. Also, we have a committee of superintendents who have voiced an interest in this being one of their priorities. I think when uh, Elizabeth Rose comes to report later, this is a question to ask her, but we have been very strongly saying this is something we want to see happen. In the high schools, a lot of the student councils have taken it upon themselves to begin these discussions, um, and in middle schools as well. So our anticipation is that we will be the first in this country to take this on as a very serious issue and to have strict guidelines. But as of right now, I would say that we have found administrators in particular to be very open to the idea, but they want more guidelines, they want more information, and they want training. And I think that's a little part and parcel of what we need to do. So have there been guidelines issued yet? What? We, we have issued guidelines. Um, and what we're doing is uh, Jared and our team is really talking to- Jared Fox. Jared Fox, yeah. sorry. Um, Jared Fox is speaking to um, both superintendents and principals and our BFSE directors to talk about how to you know, really support students when they do self-identify and making sure that um, they have access to uh, a single stall if that is what they want. I mean, I'm really grateful that Chair Drum last year pushed really hard to have the council use some discretionary dollars mm -hmm. to fund that position. I mean, one person is not enough uh, to be handling We've LGBT issues throughout the school system with uh, this not many schools and young people. Yes. I, w I, I would just say that um, everything that you said, Chancellor, sounds really positive, uh, but I would say that I don't want today, tomorrow, next week, if there isn't full clarity from the Department of Education, from Tweed, a young trans uh, child Absolutely. to show up at school and to go to use a bathroom of their choice and to be told by a staff member or be bullied and, and saying they can't use the bathroom of their preference. So I just want to ensure that as quickly as possible, we get the word out there that uh, the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, spoke out last week. The President has spoken out. They've issued uh, national guidelines uh, in North Carolina. They're talking about withholding federal funds, potentially, unless there's compliance with uh, what DOJ is saying. Uh, I saw that uh, Education Secretary John King uh, spoke out about this issue as well. So I'm really happy to hear that uh, it's your uh, thought that we're going to be on the forefront of this and we're going to be a leader. And I just want to ensure that we get that training, as you talked about, and guidelines out so that nothing happens in the meantime where a young person suffers. I would say that, you know, certainly step one and two, um, Jared Fox in particular, who's been amazing, and I've already said it to the council before, would certainly be someone we'd bring under our budget for next year, but more importantly, he has already done almost half the parent coordinators in the city. He's been going district to district borough, and at the borough level, um, giving workshops to parent coordinators so they can be, so we can do a lot of things quickly in the city, so and they turn key in on the respective schools. So um, we're very clear that this is one of our priorities. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Chair Ferris Copeland for bringing this up at the beginning of the hearing and Chair Drum for his advocacy on this and just say that I would love for us to be updated on, on when these guidelines are issued and what's talked about and also ask that we get more than one Jared Fox. Uh, that we get more people to work on this issue as well. Thank you very much. We will make sure to get you uh, the guidelines that we already disseminated and then work with you on how we can get it out even further. Thank you very much and thank you uh, Ch uh, Councilmember Johnson for that as well and for your support and your acknowledgement I think of the foresight of this council to uh, provide funding for that LGBT liaison and uh, the DOE is going to be having a first ever pride celebration on June 21st at Tweed, and I'm very proud to work with Jared on that issue as well. And I, I really say uh, that we shined last week when we had already had in place the transgender guidelines and the uh, position of the LGBT liaison and uh, can continue to move forward in that direction. And I do thank you very much for that. Uh, now we're finished with the first round. I have a couple of 
uh, questions that I would like to cover before uh, we let you go here, and then if we still have time, we'll get to round two, but I know that the Chancellor has to leave shortly and that the School Construction Authority will be coming in right after that as well. Uh, let me go first to uh, CSIS. I noticed in the budget that there's about $7.3 million uh, in the executive budget to improve and fix CSIS. Um, what, does that pro what does that look like? What are we going to see coming out of this process? And what will be those fixes to CSIS? CSIS, of course, is the special education reporting system. Uh, yes, and it's a top priority for the administration, and we've been working collaboratively with DOIT, uh, the Department of Information and IT, um, to really address some of the concerns. So what you see in the budget is approximately $13 million in that split between the DOE and DOIT, um, and that's uh, to support the application improvements and fixes within the CSIS system. But we're continuing to work together to talk about long-term fixes so that we're supporting all of our students. But first and foremost, we need the proper data so that we can identify how to best support them. So an issue that's come up since um, our hearing on this issue has been also reporting around uh, UPK special education as well. I would like to um, you know, advise you, if I may, um, that in consideration of whatever improvements they make, to the CSIS system that we look at what we're doing in terms of special education as well because um, I don't know that the system is compatible with that. And I think that because we have so many private UPK providers that I don't know if they have access to CSIS either. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how that system works. And I, what, we're, what we're trying to address within the CSIS fixes, both short-term and long-term, is really tr getting it to a place where it's a pre-K to 12 continuum, so it's really encompassing all of our grades. Um, but I'm sure that this, you know, as I mentioned, do it and, uh, and DOE are kind of having a working group to assess it all, and we all make sure to bring that to the team that pre-K should be included. Okay, good. I see that my friends are here um, from the Grannies for Peace and uh, their opposition to JR, JROTC. I'd like to address that as well. Uh, they've been constant uh, forces seen here. Barbara Harris is here. I don't understand why facsimile guns are still allowed in the schools, Chancellor. Um, I think the last hearing we had, uh, we brought up that issue, and we never really had a thorough discussion on that. I believe we also spent about $1.5 million for the JROTC program. And again, I would like to ask you if you could look at the use of these facsimile guns particularly because we have a zero tolerance toward any other types of guns in the school system. Well, this has been a school by school decision and they don't use live guns. These are dummy guns. They're not real guns. But as you know, it, it violates the chancellor's regulation for them to have facsimile guns as well. And I, I really need to look at this issue because it sends a very mixed message. And anytime I've seen the JROTC, um, at an event or whatever, they're carrying those guns. I, this conversation we can continue to have. Okay. All right. Um, the Meyer Levin School in uh, Councilmember Williams District is um, going to get a co-location or is in the process of maybe getting a co-location. That school is at 78% capacity at this point. Um, is, what, how do you determine at what point you would feed in another school. Is it, is it higher or below the 78% threshold? Because that school seems to be pretty much filled if it's at 78%. So we're continuing to look at the Meyer 11 proposal, and as you, um, we, we had it on, on deck for vote uh, about a month ago. We moved it back um, to have com continued community conversations, and we've then altered the proposal so that it is a temporary co-location and not a long-term solution. Um, so we're trying to identify space for the long-term solution. Um, I, I think um, Deputy Chancellor Rose in the Capitol hearing can talk a little bit more about space utilization and how we assess whether it, um, it's right for co-location. We're not necessarily right, but as you know, we have a state law that either mandates to find space, um, deny space, and then have to pay rent. So we're, um, we're in a tough space, but we're also trying to utilize our, our current current um, space and also trying to assess when it is appropriate to actually uh, look for rented space. Thank you. About a year ago, I had a meeting with a young man named Natili Moster. He uh, is with an organization called Yafed. He made some very serious allegations about the provision of secular education in private 
uh, schools, mostly yeshivas. Um, and he had, uh, I believe, a letter from 52 parents signed on to. And I believe that the situation that he described was that these uh, schools were not providing a secular education equivalent to that received in the public school system uh, were very serious allegations. It's coming up on the year anniversary. Where do we stand with that investigation and what can we ex when can we expect a determination on that? Well, we are still investigating and I have visited several yeshivas and we are actually um, moving faster. One of the things we have offered is professional development for teachers in these schools, particularly in the early grades. But we now have a committee that is working exclusively on this. So I expect like within a month or so, I can give you a written report. A month or so? Yeah. Okay. When, when we're done. All right. And, and I hope that we are also having in that investigation uh, actual surprise visits to the schools rather than announced visits because he has alleged that, um, that some of these schools uh, prepare for a visit uh, and, um, and, and that they're okay when people visit, but that um, outside of that, uh, anyone, or particularly males over the age of 13, are not getting this education. It's a very serious allegations that uh, we've met with him now on a couple of occasions. All right, and let's, let's kind of uh, go to community schools. And if we have time, I don't know if we will, I we can get to a second round. Um, I know that uh, good news is in the state budget where we got $175 million for community schools. I believe that about um, the $28.8 million, I think, was is going to go to the city. Um, what is our plan for the use of that funding um, for our community schools? Is that part of, will that be infused into existing community schools? How do you envision that being used? We would like to discuss this with you in looking at our strategic plan for community schools. Um, we have a, a plan to grow our community schools program over the course of the next several years. Um, and some of the funding we hope to support our current, our existing programs um, that we use tax levy dollars to support. Um, but we would love to come back to you and Councilwoman Barron to talk about the strategic plan and how it relates to both tax levy funding and state funding. Okay, so in fiscal 14, the state allocated $15 million for a round of three-year competitive grants for 30 schools, uh, school districts and partners across the state to implement community schools, also known as the Community School Grant Initiative. Twelve of those schools, or those grantees serving nearly 9,700 students, are slated for the end of their program where the funding will expire in June of 16. Do we have a plan to address this? Because that's a, couple, a month away. Yes, it's coming up really quickly, and we are uh, sitting down, we're planning right now, and we will get back to you on uh, what uh, we decide to do when we look at the entire strategic plan as it relates to those pro the state-funded programs. To those 12 schools in particular? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll have an answer on that pretty, pretty soon, I would assume. Yeah. We, we count this as our comprehensive plan and strategic plan for all the community school programs. Um, there's different funding streams for them, so we will come back to you with, about all of it. And, and these programs have been particularly successful, and I think in the last year and a half, we've also made some major shifts in how they should be seen, because many of them were seen as standalone after-school programs, and one of the things that we've done in this past year is want to see them more embedded during the school day and how the CBO works more uh, in conjunction with the school principal rather than this is the school principal's role, this is the CBO. So it's not just about how the monies are spent, but what the, uh, what the whole idea of the CBO partnership should be. So uh, we, are we saying as a system, what kind of message, what kind of message does this send to the remaining 130 community schools if we don't commit to funding those 30 that were there before, those 12 that were there before? Well, this is part of the plan that we will present to you. Okay. Then again, remember, then everybody then has to follow the rules about what a CBO does. So if, if, if they had rules then, then the rules now all have to be universal the same for all 130 schools. So their model is different than the model that you are working on in the other schools? Mm -hmm. Yep. And what about U of T community schools? Are they similar to the ones that you have, or is there an overlap there? The U of T community school model basically has a person assigned Mm -hmm. to the school who coordinates the CBOs. And U of T is a partner in some of the 130 programs that you discussed. 
Um, and so they've been part of um, our larger vision, strategic vision for community schools. Okay, and Chair um, Ferrer's Copeland reminds me that we need this information before we adopt the budget. Got it. We will. Okay. All right. Um, so we have five minutes. If you don't mind, we'll finish up with um, yeah, a little bit of a lightning round here. <laughs> okay, uh, Councilmember Gibson, followed by Grudenchik, and then Barron. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Chancellor, I just... Lightning to... round. Yes. Just wanted to ask two quick questions. Go. Uh, regarding Thrive NYC, I know that we're looking at mental health services in 100 schools that have the highest number of suspensions. Wanted to know if that includes elementary, middle, and high school, and how are we identifying those 100 schools? And once we embark on that, are we going to expand? The answer is yes. We're expecting to start with the highest suspensions to figure out what it is um, that is causing it and how do we de de-escalate that, and it's across the board, elementary, middle, and high schools. And okay. once we see the results and how that's happening, then we will take the next step. Okay, great. And then my second question, uh, in my school district, I represent nine, a little bit of eight and 12 in the Bronx. Um, we've had, unfortunately, a number of cases of youth being involved with crews and gangs. Um, I recognize you have a gang prevention and intervention unit. Wanted to understand a little bit of what that entails and does that provide services and how we are expanding that into the school system. What are some of the factors you're looking at? Well, first of all, part of the, that uh, particular group also educates principals and teachers and what to look for and how to handle it when it's observed. It also has a component uh, that goes out to PTA meetings or parent meetings to explain to parents what they should be looking for, what they should do. And then there has a component that works more closely with the NYPD on how do we change student behavior. And here, we're looking how the NYPD, and it's done very selectively across mm -hmm. the city, how they get involved in after school activities with the kids, like doing cadets corps and those kind right. of programs. Sports. So it's a preventive as well as, so there's lots of things that we're doing. Mark Rampersant under Elizabeth Rose is in charge of that program and has been very, very helpful um, and working with us in this area. Okay, and I imagine there's a lot of overlap with the anti-bullying initiative and program that, that we have, right? Absolutely. It's okay. all part of student support services, okay. which has a component at DOE, again, under Elizabeth, but also at the borough field offices, and then connected to each superintendent in every district. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Didn't even need three minutes. <laughs> Councilmember Grudenchik, Thank followed you. by Chin. And Thank Barrett. you very much. Uh, I think my question is really for the CFO, and um, he gave a, a more of a detailed talk about fair student funding than anybody else has given. I'm not on this committee, but I do appreciate numbers. I'm married to a math professor. So um, <laughs> many of my schools, I have, you know, great schools. Uh, the bulk of my district is District 26. So let me just ask a hypothetical question, and I'll take a hypothetical answer. Um, if my schools are at 82 percent, they're going to go to 87 on fair student funding. Let's assume for a second we have 500 students in the school. What is the number that I can expect, all other things being equal, uh, per student so that that 500 become, those 500 students, are they worth $100 now from 82 to 87? Are they worth $200? Every 100 on 500 is 50,000. Because uh, I hear this from a lot of my principals. Oh, sure. Uh, and uh, basically the way it works is there's a foundational uh, figure, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the per capita. If uh, I start going like this, it means my head hurts. Go okay. ahead. I, I, I don't think your head's going to hurt because, unfortunately, okay. I, I'm, you're not going to like this. Um, uh, the, the figure, the foundational figure per capita is about is about four four grand, uh, a little more right. than four grand, right? Um, so uh, if you were you would be getting 82 percent of four grand now, you'll be getting 87 percent of four grand. Is, four grand is the best way to think about it. So that's two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. So that potentially, but the, again, the per capita has thousand dollars for the school. So the, I could the per capita hasn't it. been set for the upcoming okay. year yet. So it may be subject to change. But ballpark and hypothetically speaking, two hundred dollars a student. As it, it could be that. Okay. It could be that. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Member Chin. Yeah. Quick question on uh, summer school. A lot of the middle school kids who loves their after school program are going to wind up with no summer program this year because it was not, money was not put into the executive budget and it's going to be over 30,000 of those kids. I and I have about five, 600 in my district. 
So is DOE coordinating, or are you really looking at this issue together with DYCD? Because we don't want the kids to lose um, the learning that they have gained throughout the year and to be able to not have a program during the summer. And then you have a summer in the city. Is that going to be able to help this program? And also, can you help us and work with us to advocate with the mayor to make sure that the summer program is, uh, is put back? So we've been working closely with DYCD, understanding um, that they didn't have a summer, they don't have that, that program funded for this upcoming um, summer. Um, the Summer in the City program um, is really going to be targeting elementary and middle school students, both mandated and non-mandated, so we do hope that some of the students do participate in Summer in the City programs, um, which are going to be academic enrichment. But that's not going to cover all those students. So I think that's something that the Correct. Chancellor, I hope that you will be talking to the mayor because summer program should be a component of an after school program. And I don't know what's going on with OMB that they don't think that. They think that summer is just separate and it shouldn't be. We don't want the kids to get in trouble during the summer and we don't want them to lose what they've learned during the year. So I urge you to really work with us and advocate on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what is the capacity for each middle school? Is the after-school program designed to accommodate all of the children in total enrollment in that middle school? Is that the intent? All middle school students and standalone middle schools should have access to an after-school program, and they can be electives. So they can choose which ones they want depending okay. on how big the schools are. Okay, and um, we know that when charter schools are co-located, if they spend, I believe it's over $5,000, that that has to be matched for the whole school. Who monitors that? When was the latest report given to us? And how do we know that that's actually happening? So that's monitored by both the school construction authority. By whom? Both uh, Lorraine Grillo and Elizabeth Rose um, through school construction authority and division of school facilities, which they're coming in about, I think, 10 minutes. Isn't there a report that they're supposed to issue? Because I've been told that that report has not been issued for a while. I'll look into that. I would very much appreciate it, and again, before, before we move forward in the budget. And there was a community school in the East New York section that partnered with, um, I believe it may have been the UFT, and installed a laundry, a laundry room in the school yeah. because they discovered that that was a need, had a large homeless population, shelter population. But I believe they had to bear the cost of the wiring. And several, I wanted to several, know why that. Several of our schools actually have laundromats now. Uh, there's one right in the Lower East Side that does it, but the wiring, I, I can look into that. Either. I'd appreciate that. And um, two last questions. I agree. As a principal, I wouldn't allow my children to come to school during the Halloween season with any weapons, plastic, wooden, whatever. They were not allowed in school. And I think we're sending a very destructive, contradictory message when we allow the J uh, ROTC to be in schools with weapons of any kind. So I think that that's a contradiction and we need to address that. And there was one other question, but I can't find it right now. When I find it, I'll ask it for you. Thank and you. just email me. Thank you. Okay, and then, um, Chairs, chairs with an S. Oh, I know what it was. It wasn't a question, it was a statement. Uh, in conjunction with the co-location consideration at my 11, I would also ask that you keep uh, in mind the Langston Hughes schools is a similar situation. Thank you. Okay. I have uh, just some quick ones on college access. Uh, the early college, college program is a successful model. Uh, I went and I visited Bard actually. It was a great, great program. Is there a plan to ensure that these uh, early college programs have stable funding going forward? And I noticed, I think, in, this, in the budget, but I don't know that we talked about it at this hearing, that there is some um, funding that's going to go to uh, programs that will work with um, junior colleges in the city as well. Yeah. We are expanding some of those programs, but here again, um, it, it requires a commitment on both the higher education partner as well as ours. So that is a more complicated conversation, but we are working on that. Okay. And since we have the higher ed chair here, we'll work on that together, right? Okay. And then student success centers. Um, uh, what is our strategy with them and, um, and uh, what are we going to do moving forward on student success centers? 
Um, we've been visiting some of them, and I think one of the things I would certainly like to do is pick the model ones and, and really replicate, because you know, just like all schools are not the same, not all student success centers are the same. And the ones that seem to be working the best are the ones that have very strong um, community-based organization support and are working on things like helping the students prepare applications, visiting schools. I went to one that was extraordinary in Cypress Hills where they actually developed a um, book for the parents that actually tells them how far it is from their school to whatever high school they want to apply to and has particular tutoring programs depending on where the student wants to go. So if they want to go to art schools, they get a portfolio help, and if they want specialized schools, it's, it's very, very well organized. So our idea is just to see who are the good ones out there and how do we make sure that's the focus and other people replicate the ones that are working well. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, I, I have additional questions, but I'm going to get them to you, so if you can get them back to us sure. um, before yeah. the adoption, because we're going to be using them to negotiate on the budget. But before I, we let you go, or we call this part of the hearing to an end, I wanted to talk about food pantries. We had put it in our budget response, just like the laundry yeah. rooms are, are responding to a need. We find that you know it's one thing to feed our young people while they're in school, but many are going hungry outside of school. Um, and it seems an appropriate place for us to be able to work together to put food pantries in our schools. We, many of our community-based renewal schools have food pantries. We certainly would be willing to work with you to expand that. Uh, it's certainly part of the renewal schools are also working on open on Saturdays and having the food pantries available on Saturdays to parents. The other thing that we're looking at is in schools where there's gardening or food markets that they be given out to parents. I'm thinking of one particular school that is growing vegetables but also has chickens and eggs and how do we get that to the community um, and to some degree in a reaction to parent engagement. If you come to a Saturday workshop, you get to take home. Right. So we need to figure out a way to make sure these are used but that also that we get something out of it also which is increased parent engagement. And you know, this is something, actually my mother is not my constituent, she's council member Drum's constituent. Ah. So I send her to her council member all the time. Um, and she had engaged with the council member in particular about the fact we have so many schools in our area, but the first thing young people see when they come out of school is, you know, the ice cream truck, the candy, all the junk food available, and that is what they purchase. How great would it be to have some healthy options when they come out? Um, or I, I, you know, in some ways, I, I wish we can. And you know, and you spoke to my mom. Is a you can. I spoke to your mom for <laughs> over an hour about this issue. <laughs> now, I think it's also you know change, and that's why the health programs are so important in our schools. It's changing kids' eating habits. It's not just about you know. I have grandchildren. You know, I'd love them to eat healthy, but it's about how you convince them to do that. But, you know, as part of uh, Corey Johnson's presentation on Saturday, one of the things he talked about, and I think this is a bigger job than all of us together, that one of the food markets in his neighborhood, high need neighborhood, is closing. And it was the last place where people could go to have vegetables and whatever. So he convinced, I guess, one of the more, the big names, I think Christides, mm -hmm. to start thinking about what they sell. For example, smaller portions in neighborhoods when they, where there are senior citizens, um, and how do we get the business community, and in this case the food communities, to step up and do some of the stuff? So I think together we can do a lot better for all our kids because there's almost nothing that doesn't impact on kids. There is any service in New York City that doesn't have an impact. So I think together we can do lots of things. Agreed. So I, thank I think you. that's a great note to end this hearing on. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for coming to testify. Thank we you. are going to take a 10 minute break before we start with the school construction authority. Thank, thank you. you. The food team is a little I think we're meeting.
We will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2017. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Education, chaired by Council Member Drum. We just heard from the Department of Education, and now we will hear from Lorraine Grillo, President and Chief Executive Officer of the School Construction Authority, and the Deputy, Ch and Deputy Chancellor Elizabeth Rose. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I'll open my mic to uh, my co-chair, Council Member Drum. Yes. Just want to make sure that I didn't have a formal statement prepared, and I don't. But I do want to welcome you, and um, it's good to see you as always, Deputy Chancellor and um, President Grillo. And we look forward to hearing your testimony today and um, to speaking about um, different projects. Uh, Councilmember Ferreras and I are both um, cognizant of the $868 million that was put into the budget for um, seats. I know we have a long way to go. Um, we estimated at the last hearing, I think in the preliminary budget, that we'd need an additional $4 billion to fund those seats, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to get those $4, that, those $4 billion. So thank you for coming in, and uh, yep, I will swear you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Drum and Ferreras Copeland and members of the Education and Finance Committees. My name is Elizabeth Rose, Deputy Chancellor for the Division of Operations at the New York City Department of Education. I am joined by Lorraine Grillo, President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York City School Construction Authority. We are pleased to be here today to discuss the proposed March 2016 amendments to the fiscal year 2015 to 2019 five-year capital plan which contains an increase of $1.4 billion in new funding from the 2015 adopted amendment. We are grateful to the City Council for its strong support and generous funding to our schools. Your support enables us to continue to meet this administration's goals of growth, sustainability, equity, and resilience by creating over 44,000 new school seats in areas of overcrowding and projected enrollment growth. As you know, we testified before the Education Committee regarding the capital plan in March. While there are no significant changes in the proposed March amendment from the version I presented during my most recent appearance, I welcome the opportunity to revisit that testimony, particularly since members of the Finance Committee did not participate in that hearing. However, what, in, in uh, recognition of the Chair's deferral of a, a formal statement and in the interest of time, I actually think showing is better than telling. Um, so I'd actually like to turn over to Ms. Grillo to present the presentation on the capital plan, and then we can come back to any additional comments and te testimony. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Thank you, Chair Drum and Ch Chair Ferreras Copeland. Um, we're excited to be here uh, to give you our presentation of the capital plan. I'll just go over this briefly, and then we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Whoops. Here we go. One second. Okay, so this, is, this plan, uh, this amendment differs from the original capital plan uh, in a couple of ways. We've, uh, the proposed plan now is at $14.9 billion. The original adopted plan was 13.5. It's an increase of $1.4 billion. Um, a portion of that is ResOA money, and we thank the Council for their efforts. Um, again, $286 million in Hurricane Sandy reimbursements. Uh, renewal schools, school-based health centers, uh, an increase of $72 million. And, of course, we've discussed the proposed additional funding, $868 million, in recognition of the increase in seat need. That will allow us to build 11,800 additional seats. Uh, the capital plan is broken down into three main categories, $5.7 billion in capacity, that's new seats, $5.5 billion in capital investments, those are projects in our existing buildings, and $3.7 billion in mandated programs, which I'll go over in a bit. <clears throat> in capacity, $4.5 billion is uh, allocated for the creation of approximately 44,000 new seats, 
uh, that's up from 32,000 in the adopted plan. It includes the pre-K initiative, which created or is creating 7,600 new pre-kindergarten seats, $490 million in class size reduction funding, and $62 million in facility replacements. In new capacity, the vast majority of those seats, 41,000, are in the um, PSIS level, and the remaining seats are for ISHS buildings. And those, for the most part, are in the borough of Queens with some funding for high school seats in Staten Island. This is the breakdown by school district, the capacity, uh, the increased funding, as well as additional need that is not funded. In capital investments, as you know, uh, every year the SCA conduct, conducts a building condition assessment survey where we examine every school building with a team of architects and engineers to rate all the major systems. Um, $3.1 billion is to upgrade those systems that we are ranking as number five, which is the worst condition. $450 million for the removal of uh, transportable classroom units and $125 million for uh, athletic field upgrades. Well, I, there is a section in capital investment for school enhancements, which includes restructuring, safety, middle school science labs. As you know, in our last capital plan, we con um, concentrated on of making sure that every high school student had access to a science lab. In this cap capital plan, we're focused on middle schools. $100 million for accessibility and $45 million for other upgrades like libraries, auditoriums, physical fitness, and the like. Included is $100 million for bathroom upgrades. If you remember, the original capital plan had $50 million at the city council's insistence, we added another $50 million for those bathroom upgrades, and $650 million for technology. Mandated programs. These programs include things like uh, $480 million to complete the PCB lighting fixture replacements, which uh, we are coming to the end of the road. We will be completed for about 750 schools by December 2016. It includes funding for boiler conversions and our wrap-up insurance policy, which covers all of our work, and $661 million for projects that began in the last plan are being completed in this plan. And again, the, this is the list of transportable classrooms that we've removed. And these are the ones that are in process now. And these are just some very lovely pictures of some of the new buildings that we've either opened or will open shortly. And these are just some examples. And that's it, and we're, we're happy to answer any questions. So I'd like to actually um, just highlight a few things from my testimony. Uh, I'd like for the full thing to uh, become part of the record, but just to highlight a couple of things. Related to temporary classroom units, um, as Lorraine showed, we have removed 73 TCUs, and we have plans for removal of 113 more leaving a remaining balance of approximately 170 that we are working on developing removal plans for. Um, this plan also continues several important mayoral initiatives, obviously including university pre-kindergarten, universal pre-kindergarten, excuse me, um, but also some newer initiatives, uh, specifically focused on ensuring our students become college and career ready in our digital and information age. We will make certain that technology upgrades remain a priority in the proposed amended plan. We're committed to bridging any existing gaps in technology in our schools in order to implement the administration's instructional priorities of computer science for all, 
as well as, as well as other programs including the software engineering pilot program and advanced placement computer science courses. Um, as part of that, the New York State Smart Schools Bond Act, DOE's proposed allocation of the Smart Schools Bond Act proceeds, known as the Smart Schools Investment Plan, allocates funds to technology, pre-K for all, and the removal of TCUs. That investment plan is available on the DOE's website. Uh, the, the SSIP was approved by the Panel for Educational Policy last month and has been submitted to the state for its approval. And we expect to hear back from the Smart Schools Bond Act Review Board in the late summer. So uh, with that, I concur with Lorraine um, that we would be happy to address any of your questions. Thank you both. Thank you for keeping your uh, opening statements concise so that we're able to ask questions. We really appreciate it. Um, I just have to say it's been a pleasure to uh, work with you. Um, there is something to be said about seeing young people in new school buildings. There's this sense of pride and um, oftentimes in areas such as mine where families are living um, four and five to a room um, because parents can only rent a room. Um, to have a school facility is their only opportunity to be able to see expansion, to feel like they can be free, um, and to engage in, in different activities. So I say that to say that we need to build more <laughs> and build faster. Um, and I, and, you know, I, I thank this administration for putting in the additional funds and that we were able to um, put that in so it's not part of the negotiations that we're going to be doing now, but kind of just getting that in early on, which I know helps you a great deal because then you can plan appropriately. The reality is that we can put in an additional billion dollars. We can put in an additional $1.2, $1.4 billion over what we have existing but we have a siting problem, um, especially in areas like mine um, and council member drums. We are trying to be as creative as possible to think of what lots, where can we build the school. Um, so despite having available funds for new capacity in various neighborhoods, SCA has been unable to meet the need for capacity in many neighborhoods due to difficulties in finding sites for schools. With respect to the neighborhoods that have been provided funding for new capacity, do you anticipate difficulties with siting in any of those that may prevent you from constructing seats? And what is the overall plan or methodology for finding sites and do you ever work with other city agencies to find sites for schools? May I? Please. Sure. Thank you so much and it's been a pleasure working with you, especially uh, trying to find sites in your very overcrowded neighborhoods. We, we are constantly looking. Uh, we've been more successful in siting in the last two plans than all of the previous plans. We have made a concerted effort to, to do this, walking basically block by block. In some districts, we've walked, walked through uh, the neighborhoods with the community boards and the CECs as well as the elected officials. Um, we also investigate, obviously, leasing existing buildings as well as going into sites that we would not typically be able to build in and being creative in the way we do it. There has been historical problems in certain districts, certain school districts. For example, yours, District 24, um, District 15 in Brooklyn, District 20 in Brooklyn. Very difficult, but that doesn't keep us from trying. Do we work with other agencies? Yes, constantly. Uh, particular uh, with city planning on all new developments, uh, rezoning, things like that. We're, we're constantly working with them as well as going back to um, DCAS, for example, to find any properties that they may have that we could use. So we're always, always looking. We have brokers in every one of the five boroughs who are constantly looking and of course we take every suggestion that either the council gives us or the CECs or anyone and we investigate thoroughly. Um, what's the staffing level that you have that's dedicated for siting? Again, as I said, we have in, in supervisory positions, we have uh, three people, but they manage five real estate brokerage firms. And in, in, I'm sorry, four. Uh, 
each borough, uh, but one in uh, South Brooklyn and Staten Island. So, so they, they are constant, and they only uh, are paid by commission, so it's to their advantage to find a site that we will purchase. Council members and other stakeholders have suggested sites for schools. Have you ever used, um, has there ever been a challenge with the proposed sites? Um, or what would those challenges be? So as we're trying to look at this next phase of being able to partner with you, what is, you know, what are sites that don't work? Right. Okay. Well, in the beginning of your question, have we ever worked with council members? I know you uh, have. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, council member Drum. <laughs> Uh, has found an exciting site that we're getting ready to per, uh, to build on. Is that White Castle? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, very we should exciting. get rid of it. Very exciting. <laughs> um, there are a number of things that don't work for us. Right. Obviously, um, if a site is, is too small, it has to make sense cost effectively. It has to be in a situation where um, we've done all of our environmental due diligence to make sure that the site is, is appropriate for students. We have to look at traffic patterns. We have to look at neighboring uses, for example. You don't want to put a school in the middle of a highly industrial area where children will have a difficult time getting there or next to a highway, for example, things like that. So it's, it's a bunch of different things. It's the location, obviously. It's also the um, environmentals, which is very important. Um, so, you know, right now, though, I will say size has always been a concern, but it's almost no longer a concern because we will try to squeeze in the school in just about any area we can, particularly in District 24. Great. Thank you. Um, right now, rezoning must increase school overcrowding by 5% to trigger even consideration for new schools to be built. Do we need reforms to the zoning process, or is this a threshold, in your opinion, adequate? I we believe it's adequate at this point. We work very closely with all the city agencies to see what kind of impact their, their changes or rezonings will have. And so far, we feel they've been on target, but we will continue to monitor and continue to work with the agencies. So I have two other focuses, and then we're going to open it. I'm going to give it to my co-chair. School bathrooms, as you know, you know, we've been working together um, uh, for, for some time and been able to accomplish about 25 schools that will be um, putting in feminine hygiene products mm -hmm. for free. Um, and we're hoping to have this across, the, in particular in this focus, across all schools. The proposed amendment includes $100 million for a program to upgrade bathrooms, which focuses on aesthetic upgrades such as fixtures and tiling. Many bathrooms do not have small garbage cans inside the stalls. This should be provided in all girls and gender neutral bathrooms so female students can properly dispose of hygiene products. We were pleased to find that the hooks on the doors were now mandatory, but the garbage cans are also a necessity. How many bathrooms do we anticipate completing with these funds? And will you provide the council with a bathroom breakdown report showing the actual cost of all completed pro projects by bathrooms and the projected cost for each bathroom not yet renovated? Yep. So we can absolutely provide you with information about all of the bathrooms that have already been completed and their costs. Um, we will be able to add the disposal uh, cans for middle school and high school bathrooms going forward. Um, and going forward, uh, the additional bathrooms, we have to just assess how many we will be able to do with the remaining funds in this program, um, considering uh, additional issues around accessibility that we need to consider as we move these, as we move these bathrooms forward. Okay. I would really appreciate you sharing those numbers with us before our adoption of this budget, just because we're going to be using this for um, mm -hmm. negotiating purposes. And, I, and I'm very much appreciative of your response to this issue that we identified. And this came from a focus group that I had with girls that said, we love that you're going to provide feminine hygiene products. Some of our bathrooms, we don't have anywhere to dispose of these. So it just seemed like one of those no-brainers mm -hmm. um, that we, we um, should have and that we're responding to so quickly. I, I, I applaud you on that. Adding air conditioning to school buildings often requires electrical upgrades, which can be funded with city capital dollars. The council would like to see 
uh, the SCA upgrade the wiring in many schools and as many schools as possible so that air conditioners can be added with expense funds. We would like to see the SCA create a program that would enable a lot of these classrooms to have air conditioning. Like the bathroom project, is this, is this something that the council should collaborate on DOE and SCA to create the plan? And what has the SCA done to get air conditioning in more of the older school buildings? There was nothing more heartbreaking for me as a Beacon School director um, that, and today doesn't, it's not an example of that, but many years past, by May, the rooms are 80 degrees. In the summer when we were running summer camps, it was like 90 degrees. And the, the trick was that everybody got a little time to go to the computer room because that was the only room that had air conditioning. So I had to like bring the kids in and take them out of the air conditioned computer rooms. So while I know that I haven't been a Beacon Director now for quite some time, I know that these challenges still remain in many of our schools. So how can we partner with you to make this not such an obstacle to get wiring in our buildings? So there actually is. Uh, a budget line in the capital plan that proposes we spend $50 million on electrical upgrades specifically for buildings that do not have the capacity for air conditioning. Um, and we think we, we will be looking at this in terms of buildings, in terms of the, the fewest number of classrooms that currently have air conditioning, um, but also schools that are eligible for a free and reduced price lunch as one of the criteria that we will look at in selecting so schools. So those would be your priorities? Yes. Now, but you, is this I would need to add that this is the electrical piece, the capital piece. There is still the question of the air conditioners themselves. And I know that this is a priority for you and uh, we need the support from City Council on the expense side. Uh, in order to actually provide these schools with the air conditioners. Would you be able to provide us um, the average cost of what you think um, it would cost for us to be able to provide these air conditioning units in our schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want the mayor to baseline this, but we should know the number to see how we can partner. Thank you. And now I'll give it over to my co-chair, Chair Drum. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Ferreras Copeland. Um, let me start off with a demographer RFP. I understand that you're going to be putting out, or one has already been put out, for a new demographer or demographers. Uh, can you elaborate more on the proposal as to what you are looking for in terms of that demographer? Oh, and will it be more than one? Yes, actually, um, we've, we've had for the last several years two different demographer firms. Um, and one of those firms, the, the principal has retired. Mm -hmm. So we are now out on the street with an RFP. Actually, we went out with an RFP. We did not get the response that we wanted and we're going to reissue that RFP. Obviously, we need folks with experience in the area. That's really what we're looking for. So of course, and I, I think you would agree from the preliminary hearing that having a demographer who would include the mayor's plans for these additional 200,000 units of affordable housing is really important and, and, and we need that as soon as possible. And when do you think we, we may have this demographer? Well, we are going to reissue it, but I just want to assure you that we work very, very closely with the demographers at city planning. Uh, actually, Joe Salvo, who has a, a, a citywide reputation for being very, very accurate. So we do that as well. So the, the new RFP will go out, it will be several weeks on the street, and then hopefully we'll have somebody in place really quick. Thank you. And um, Smart Schools Bond Act money. Um, I know a, a great portion of it is going to go to uh, trailer removals and uh, UPK, I believe. Um, how, much is it, uh, how much of it is going to technology? I have that. So about $383 million of the 783 is allocated for technology. Okay. And then um, I have gotten a lot of requests from principals um, because I've been pretty good to them actually about getting them uh, carts and um, other pieces, you know, um, desktop computers. Some of them have been using some of the reservoir money for playgrounds and auditorium upgrades. But they're requesting now iPads. And this has remained a constant problem. And we really need to work on this because, as you know, they're assistive learning devices. Are we making any progress with the controller's office on that issue? 
my understanding is that we are not anticipating any change from the controller's office about iPads or other tablets. Well, just to be clear, um, you know, other districts around the state are able to use this money for that purpose. And I think it's really unfair that our students cannot. And uh, considering that this is a modern age um, and our students need that, I, I recently attended a, a workshop for teachers. The supervisors of social studies had a workshop, and they have uh, these, like, glasses that you can look into, and if you put your phone in there, you can get a, a, a virtual tour of, you know, any city in the world, and it's fascinating, but our kids don't have that access if we don't have that type of equipment, so really want to urge us to continue to fight for those, for those devices in our schools. I also met recently with um, advocates for students with physical disabilities. And I know that the U.S. Department of Justice issued a letter to the NYC DOE in December of 2015 um, saying that it failed to make its elementary schools accessible to and un, uh, usable by individuals with disabilities in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So uh, the capital plan includes funding to make a total of only nine elementary schools and eight middle or high schools partially or fully accessible over the five years. Only two schools in Queens, three in Manhattan, and four in each of the other three boroughs. In light of the DOJ's finding, is the DOE planning uh, to propose any additional funding to make more elementary schools accessible to students, parents, and teachers? Well, let's start with all of our new capacity and all of the funding for new capacity in our system is in fact creating additional accessible schools. So that's a significant amount of money. It's $4.5 billion that is creating more accessible schools. Um, on top of that, um, we've allocated the $100 million for accessibility upgrades. Um, some of those projects have been identified, but I believe we still have a couple room for a couple more that have not yet been identified in the plan that we will be pursuing. And we look at those specifically based on the providing the greatest equity across districts. So a district like District 24, which has a large number of new buildings, has a high percentage of accessible buildings. A district like District 16 has mostly older buildings, and so it has a smaller percentage of its buildings that are fully accessible. So we allocate that $100 million based on trying to raise every district up to the same level. Um, and then finally, the money that we spend on capital improvements in our buildings, including the funds allocated to bathrooms, to science labs, libraries, auditoriums. As we do those projects in our buildings, we also expand accessibility. So uh, with our bathroom upgrade projects, we will be looking at where can we upgrade a first floor bathroom to be accessible that would substantially increase the accessibility of that building, uh, first floor accessibility being sort of the first step. How does your definition of accessibility differ from that uh, which is being required for the Board of Elections? In other words, from what I hear, Board of Election accessibility means being able to get into the first floor to go to vote. Mm -hmm. Is that the same definition that we're using for what our schools are accessible? Because I think getting to you know, second and third floors is, is important as well. So we look at whether a student can access the program of a school. Um, and that can be done in a number of ways. Either the student can be accommodated on the ground floor and all of the major public assembly spaces are also on the ground floor and the school can uh, bring the program to the first floor for that student or that, but that would be functionally accessible for the student, or a building that was entirely accessible with an elevator and all the spaces in the building, that is accessible. Um, we do have buildings that are accessible to the entire program, but where every single space in the building is not accessible. So for example, we have a wonderful school on the Upper West Side that has a very strong program for, that, for students who are mobility impaired. There is a gymnasium in that building that isn't accessible, but there's also a gymnasium that is accessible. So the student can access the entire program without the building being fully accessible 
in accordance with uh, ADA. So with many of the choice programs, either in middle school or high school, um, are students with disabilities matched with buildings that are accessible? So at a minimum, every district has at least four elementary schools and middle schools. I believe that four. Uh, that are accessible and so a student who has a need for uh, accommodations, we are able to uh, provide them a school that is fully accessible for them. We also are improving our process for parents and students to reach out and say, I have this need, can you help accommodate? And we try to work with the school and the family. Do you have a listing of what um, specifically makes a school inaccessible? A check off of some sort or? How do you determine inaccessibility? So it's more we've gone the opposite, where we have positively identified all of the buildings that are accessible, and we publish those on our website, and also we work very closely with the Office of Student Enrollment to ensure that student enrollment staff in the field are knowledgeable about which buildings have accessible features for students. Okay, let me just go to um, the cost for some seats. In preparing for this hearing, I noticed that in District 20, at um, I guess it's a kin uh, in in Brooklyn. Um, I'm not sure what school it is. Uh, it's a location, 8501 Fifth Avenue, the pre-K. Um, the SEA has allocated uh, six million five hundred and twenty thousand for 18 seats. In another, period, in another part of the district for the pre-K um, at 1668 46th Street, 6,800,000 6, has been allocated for 180 seats. The cost per pupil is very different. The cost per pupil at the first one is 330, uh, 362,000 mm -hmm. and the cost at the second one is only 37,000 per student. And I noticed that throughout the report, maybe not as, as, as glaring as that, but can you explain why there's such a difference in the cost per seat? Sure. Well, obviously there is, um, the larger the school, the less expensive per square, per square foot it's going to be. But um, it's very challenging to find spaces that are available for pre-K. Uh, in the case of the 46th Street site, we were able to find a large site, and with that, accommodating 180 students for a reasonable cost. The other one, and, and again, let's go back to the, it's District 20, which has been historically difficult to, um, to find space. Uh, again, the, we were able to find very raw space that required tremendous amount of upgrades in order to finish this pre-K site. And, you know, it's one of those things in that particular district because sites are at a premium. It's very, very, very difficult to find space. And we have uh, students, obviously, who are were on waiting lists trying to get in. We found a site, we grabbed it, and whatever it cost to build it out, we did. So in the, at that site or at, at some of these sites, are these sites that we will own, the city will own, or are we talking leases for the, for or a combination? <coughs> for this, yes, well, it's exactly, on, many of the exactly a sites. combination, but for those two sites, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're both leased. They're both leased. They're both leased. So that is a part of the yep. decision-making process there as yep. well. Okay, um, and before I just turn it over to... Um, my colleagues as well. Um, I'm sure you, I think you have, but um, you know we, we are four billion dollars short. Um, have you been advocating uh, to make sure that we get those four billion dollars moving forward? Well, as you can see, we've been advocating along with the members of the city council for more funding, and the mayor recognized that need. Um, we will continue to do so, um, and hopefully, we will have you as partners. Thank you, Chair Drum. We've been joined by Council Members Matty Kalos, Chin Johnson, Rodriguez, Barron, uh, Lander, and Miller. We will now hear from Council Member Matty followed by Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Lorraine, one thing I want to uh, start off with is um, the PCB lighting fixtures, and that we're going to be complete by the end of the year. I want to thank you. I want to do, I want to do, give a shout out to the former minority leader, Vin Ignizio, who was uh, his leadership uh, five years ago was um, started this, and I, I want to thank you because I think we're what five years ahead. Yep. So uh, I do want to, th on behalf of my schools and the schools, uh, thank you for, for pushing that forward. And it's going to be nice when we complete all the schools. Do you know how many schools we have left? I think we have approximately 120 in construction right now. Okay. And then yeah. uh, by, the, by the summer, you're going to do a lot of them? or you Absolutely. Just, okay. Absolutely. But definitely done by the end of the year. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I do want to thank... Uh, you and, and your staff for a great work out in Staten Island, uh, Brian McGinn and uh, Fred, Fred Malley and Steve Gonzalez and Karen, uh, just a great team to work with. So thank you. Uh, Staten Island Tech opening two weeks ago, three weeks ago was great. So thanks for working with us on that. Um, just a few things I want to go over. The new school in the West Shore, uh, we're still citing locations and, and looking at uh, the ones that we sent to you. And is there any update or we're, just, we're still looking at the locations? Um, we're, we're constantly looking, but we can certainly give you an update on where we are. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll meet soon. Sure. And um, the pre-K, uh, I think there's three sites that are coming on yes, online, yes. Uh, Forest Avenue, the Teleport, and I think one on the North Shore. Opening in September. They will be open in September? Oh, they open. They both open. All of them are open now. Forgive Teleport's them. open, but the one on Forest is open too? The pre-K on that one opened in September. The, the 1625 other. Forest. Yeah. That but, one's... But the... The, the Verizon building? Yeah. 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 The rest, it's all, all complete with construction? The remaining two floors are still in construction. That's what I thought. The remaining floors. two? Yes, and they will be open in September. And this September? Correct. Okay, but that's that the construction that's elementary. going on now, right? I'm sorry? That's what the construction is that's going on now? Correct. The top two floors? Correct. Okay. Um, and the last thing that I... I and we're going to have to talk about this offline, uh, to be honest with you, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, PS9, um, which was the old PS48, where we made the new PS48. <laughs> so now we're, uh, um, the principal, the Marco's done a great job there, and, and, and they're starting to get a capacity, and, you know, we, we have space issues, and we're going to have to discuss this, Lorraine, and I know it's <laughs> going back uh, why we got PS48, the new school, but... Um, there are some issues we're going to have to discuss, and um, so I think we should meet offline when, when we have a chance. And the last thing I, I do want to bring up generally is the five-year capital plan. Can you walk me? I mean, I, most of my colleagues and I, we give a lot of our capital budget to school. I give about 50 percent. Can you walk me how uh, the process of how, you know, you, you pick the capital? I know you, you ask us all for suggestions, but at what point, uh, what, what is the process of you actually selecting which projects uh, should get on the five-year capital plan and so so if you if you're discussing uh, regular capital improvement projects um, as I talked about earlier every year we send uh, a team of architects and engineers to every single school building that we have and with that we rate the major systems one through five five being the worst condition and basically those are the things that go into the capital plan as is if you're talking about the suggestions that come from the city council for additional projects, the very first thing we're going to do is go into this quote unquote BCAS system, which is building condition and assessment. find the conditions. And we'll find out what the okay. conditions are. And the ones that are the worst are obviously the ones that are going to go first. So it's based pretty much on the conditions and pretty much on priority the, from there. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear by, uh, from Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Kalos, followed by Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to both of you for the work that you do. You know, it's, we're here to ask easy ta and tough questions, but you know, it's not an easy place to be when you are responsible for building our school. Uh, one concern that I have, and it started for me at the local level, even though I want to get some answer at the local level, but then I see as a city-wide issue too, is that I have a school, IS-218, a Salome Ureña built, a, it could be probably like 25 years ago. When the school was built, it has a central air, air condition 
for the auditorium and the cafeteria. Today, as they're getting ready, ready for the graduation, you no, know, one more year, DOE school construction has not fixed the central air condition. And I think that, and I don't want to take uh, the council member can put capital because this is not a new project. This is a school that was built uh, with a central air condition. Whatever got broken, I'm pretty sure, and I always tell anyone, when I have any conversation, I think about that I'm Gerbrewer, that if a school is in the upper middle class community and their air condition is broken, we will not be going to the local council member to say, put money to fix the central air condition. The school will fix it immediately because we have close to a thousand students in that or more in those three schools that we have those buildings that use the auditorium, mm -hmm. that use the cafeteria, and in a 95 degree, it is unacceptable that, you know, if it's a matter that was broken, it's not fixed. So I can put as a recommendation for you to look at it, but for me it's about in general, how, are, how is the school construction looking at those cases when this is not about we asking on can we put capital money for air condition? Yes. This is a school that they have everything in place, that the central system got broken. Mm -hmm. We should be able to have the funding to fix it and not just waiting for us to be advocating. How do you make assessment when on, on those type of situations citywide? Well, and of course, I don't, I leave my mm -hmm. local one as for you, if you can look at it. Well, the first thing that we would do is have our Division of School Facilities assess whether it is something that can be fixed without replacing the system. Um, once the School Construction Authority builds the building, the Division of School Facilities then takes on the responsibility for maintaining the buildings, including the systems within it. So the first thing we would look at is what can we do from a maintenance perspective? Is there an opportunity to fix parts of it that would get it back up and running? If it then is something that has to be a new capital project, we then work with the School Construction Authority. Great. My second question is, again, on the process. Last year, Chris and Queen was able to get $7 million to renovate a, a, the male pool, still I have not seen a phase one of that pool. So it's not that here is the local council member. We want you for you to put the money. This is about a pool that used to be used, at, say Olympic pool, mm -hmm. in a community where the community board don't have an indoor pool. $7 million sitting there since the 2014 fiscal budget. I've been asking for updated. I have not been getting the updated. And for me, it's unacceptable. Okay. Yes, uh, council member, we are familiar with that particular pool that you're discussing. Um, we did a scope and design for that to upgrade it, and we put it out for a public bidding. The bids came in well over the budget that we had estimated. Uh, we are looking at it again and going to rebid it. What was the last thing that you said? It, it came in, the bids that came in from the contractors were well over the budget. And people who have expertise on that, I can tell you Asfa Green, uh -huh. who is a great, like, you know, institution, based on their own observation, we are not building a new pool. And for me, I hope that you can put your leadership to go all those data, because what I heard from people, first of all, when I had a conversation with the school construction, I was asked from three to five million dollars. I always asked for more. I got Chris and Queen to put me seven million dollars, two million more than what I was asked. And again, great relationship. I trust you, but your staff who I made a request to come back and give me a briefing. For months, I've been waiting for that briefing. Well, I apologize on behalf of the staff, and we're happy to meet with you and brief you on that.
Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Johnson, followed by Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you uh, to the chairs. Uh, Lorraine, it's great to see you. Deputy Chancellor, it's great to see you. Uh, I want to thank you, Lorraine, for all of your uh, incredible work and working with the community as well as your staff, Melanie, uh, on 75 Morton, a uh, new school that we're very excited about for next year, as well as all the other issues that we bring to you on a regular basis. I want to just follow up on uh, Chair Ferris Copeland's questions with regard to electrical upgrades. Um, the Bayard Rustin uh, Educational Campus, six co-located schools on West 18th Street, five high schools, and one middle school, Quest to Learn. Uh, when I went over the capital asks uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we have been asking for a couple of years now for electric upgrades. A brand new science lab was put into the school, but they can't use the lab. Uh, in the best way possible because the electricity doesn't work. So it doesn't make much sense. Half the Wi-Fi in the school won't work because of electricity problems. And the cost is somewhere around, I think, $1.5 million to pay for it. And you all requested Reso A funds from me, but I wasn't able to do it because I thought it was something that the SCA should be paying for on its own. And seeing this money in the capital plan, I wanted to just ask, if that school potentially qualifies for for this money. Not the school, the complex. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know all the details of that. I apologize, but I'd be happy to sit down with you and go over exactly what it is. I know that there's been some conversations with your offices, but again, I don't know the fine details, so I'll be happy to meet with you separately to talk about it. I will always meet with you, but we need, we need the money. I mean, the school doesn't have electricity in a lot of places. It's a real problem. And it's not electricity for air conditioning. Right. It's electricity for learning, technology, science labs. Again, we will look at it carefully. Okay. Um, I similarly wanted to ask about uh, bathroom upgrades. I saw that you had mentioned in your testimony, Deputy Chancellor, uh, the doubling of the money the council has advocated on this from $50 million to $100 million. Uh, I put in uh, money last year for bathroom upgrades at the, at the lab middle and high school on 17th Street. There are additional schools that, where the bathrooms are in pretty poor uh, shape. And I wanted to just, as uh, the minority leader asked, understand how you actually, I think it's probably through the BCAS uh, system that's done every year, but to understand if any of my schools that I brought to your attention could qualify for this expanded pool of capital money. So uh, we can absolutely t take a look at what you've identified as bathrooms that you think need upgrades. For the bathroom upgrades, since these are bathrooms that are functional, they're actually not identified through the BCAS process because the BCAS process assesses building systems, what is fundamentally working or not working. Our bathrooms are functional, so we are using um, information from council members, from principals, from our school facilities and custodian staff in the field to identify the ones that are in the worst shape and therefore need to be prioritized for this program. Uh, but we're happy to understand schools that you have in mind and, and see where they are on our list. And when you mentioned uh, accessibility uh, for schools, PS11 on uh, 20th Street in Chelsea. Familiar with it? Fabulous school, Principal Bob Bender, great guy, amazing school, uh, is not ADA accessible. So students and parents who are, uh, have mobility issues, who are disabled, cannot even get into the school. There's no lift in the front. And we have put that consistently on our capital needs list multiple years. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a need parents are asking for it who can't come for uh, parent-teacher conferences or participate in school events. They have no way to get into the building. And we've been told that it is it's just too much money. Um, so uh, in this instance, there's no accessibility because people who are in a wheelchair or have mobility issues can't enter the school at all. So we know we have a, no, a number of buildings where we have accessibility um, challenges. 
uh, and many of our older buildings, and PS11 is certainly one of them, um, are not currently accessible. District 2 overall, about 65% of our schools in District 2 are accessible, so it's one of our districts with the highest percentages of accessibility, um, but we do try to do, if there are individual cases of parents who have a particular need for, for example, parent-teacher conferences, we will work with you, work with them to accommodate how can we ensure that they have access to a parent-teacher conference. But can we work on scoping that project and finding out what the real cost is to make the building accessible? Um, what I can tell you is the other accessibility projects that are currently already identified for the capital plan, they range in the, in, in, in the range of seven to ten million dollars for a full accessibility project. So full accessibility of one of our older buildings is a very expensive But can we work project. on scoping the project to understand what the cost is for that particular location? I think we should discuss offline. Um, so Again, District 2 at the moment has one of our highest I understand, but district, I'm asking about this school. So you won't commit to scoping this individual school for accessibility? We have many other districts where a full and accessibility project would be a higher priority. But it would be nice to at least know the cost. We can give you some comparables based on other buildings that we have done that are similar. I think that's probably the, the most efficient way that we can provide some information. Well, I, I don't think that's a satisfactory answer for the children and parents that go to PS11. Mm -hmm. Asking for a cost on, uh, on something like this is not asking for it to be funded. It's asking for us to know what the overall cost is so we know in the future. Uh, thank you to the chairs. I just want to end with this. I'm putting in additional money for the rooftop space uh, at uh, 75 Morton Street to make it a green roof and uh, we have other folks that are going to put money in for that as well. I'm very excited about that project. I'm not excited about the answer on PS11, and I hope that we can work on that together. Thank you to the chairs. Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member King. Thank you to the chairs, and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, a part of the documentation that you submitted said that the TCUs has a budget of $450 million for the removal of all remaining TCUs. So you've actually removed 73, and how many more need to be removed? So there are another 113 that are, uh, have had the removal plan identified, and another 180 beyond that that we still need to develop the removal plan. What? In total, a little over 280. Why haven't the other 180 uh, had a plan match to those facilities? What does it take to make a plan that there's not even a plan for them? So it, it takes assessing where there is space in the community, in the neighboring areas, to identify a plan for how we would relocate students who may be currently served in those TCUs. So where did the students go uh, who were at the schools, let's say in District 16, uh, District 19, uh, 214, 29302, those schools are targeted, they have a plan. So will those students go to the main building? Will they be accommodated in the main building? Or will they be moved elsewhere? So it varies on an individual building by building basis. I don't have the specific details for each of the programs mm -hmm. right here, but I'd be happy to follow up with Okay, you. does the principal have the plan? Since they already identified as having a plan, does the if principal? If there's already a removal plan in place, I imagine that they likely do. Okay, so you're not sure that they do? I think we will follow up with you on those specifics. Okay. I would, I would think it would be helpful for them to have been involved in creating the plan so that they would know uh, that this is the best interest for the children. Um, what is the cost to, what's the average cost of doing an athletic field? I see you have $125 million. What's the average cost and how are the sites selected? Well, that actually varies, but the way that the sites are selected for, well, for the most part, let me just explain. Uh, if you could about, give me the quick version. About 12 years ago, a group called Take the Field uh, yes. partnered with the city right. and built a number of athletic fields. Their, their typical shelf life is about 10 years. Right. So we're reaching the end of that now. And what we're doing is examining each and every field to see what the needs are. So. You know, so what about those schools if, that have not had anything in the last 10 years? 
uh, more than 10 years. All right. So if a school has had no athletic right. field at all, and I was building for the ground up, you're looking at somewhere between 20 okay. and $25 million to build a new, completely new athletic field. You said $25 million? That's correct. So you're looking at perhaps five fields. No, no. Now, no. that's for a brand new field. What we're looking at here are fields that exist now. Okay, so what's in your upgraded. budget to build brand new fields? Again, it's $125 million total, so it depends upon the current condition. Okay, all right. Um, moving quickly, the class size reduction identifies three sites mm -hmm. for the $490 million, and one of those sites is the East New York Family Academy. How much of that money is designated for that school, and what does that encompass? Well, in the case of East New York, Family Academy, um, as you know, we will be building them a new school ground up. So um, whatever, at this point it's not been designed yet, but as it is designed, certainly we will have estimates along the way, but they will have a brand new school building. So, uh, you know, it depends on, on what the size is and all of the amenities within it. And have you identified the site? We are looking at building on the current site of East New York Family Academy, um, relocating those transportable classrooms, relocating those students in transportable classrooms and being able to build there. Okay, and what's the estimated cost if it's on that site? What do you anticipate would be the cost to build a brand new school? Again, it depends upon... Uh, what's the range? Uh, gosh, we, we could be looking at what, $70 million approximately. Seven zero million. million? Yeah. Okay. And what's the timeline for that? Timeline right now, I think we're working with um, our space planning group to talk about relocation space for those children, and then we need a year to design the building, and after that it would go into construction, so that would be approximately two and a half, three years. Two and a half to three years? Yeah. Okay. And finally, uh, co-location. Um, we've met and talked about several schools that are proposed to be co-located. We've heard earlier about My 11, and I'm also advancing the cause of PS 233, the Langston Hughes School, based on the fact that this is a school that has been uh, strangled in a way because parents fled when they heard that school was on a particular list and thought that it would not be most beneficial for their children. So there was a huge reduction in the population. The school met all the criteria and was no longer in the list, but they were not identified as having come off that list, so they continued to have a dwindling population. The principal has worked very diligently and very hard, and now that population is increasing. And uh, we know that that school, as we've been there and looked at it, has great facility. The teachers have worked and gotten grants to build their library to have a full film recording studio and to have other enhancements for their academic permit programs that are very beneficial to creating all that goes. And they have a large special ed population and there are many of the rooms that they use for one-on-one -on -one services. And the chair earlier talked about children who are living in many cramped, yes, cramped situations. And we believe that any co-location at this time going forward where the school is growing would in fact uh, hinder children's ability to have those academic enhancements, the arts and the other activities that are going forward. So what is the timetable? What, where are we in terms of that proposal? I know it was taken off the last calendar and where are we now? Well, so first of all, thank you, Councilman, for meeting with us at the school uh, a few weeks ago and, and having those conversations with us. Um, our head of space management has also uh, met recently with the principal um, to ensure that we understand uh, the concerns as well as the specialty rooms that they have that they are particularly concerned about. Um, the proposal is still uh, scheduled for the panel for educational policy meeting that is this week, this Wednesday evening, um, and we are anticipating that the panel would vote on that proposal on Wednesday. Okay, I'm anticipating that you'll have a lot of pushback. Be prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from Councilmember Chin, followed by Councilmember King. 
Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, I know see that in the capital investment, uh, the budget, you have 45 million allocated for uh, physical, uh, physical fitness, library, auditorium upgrade. I mean, in terms of Reso A project that comes in from school, let's say in my district, there have been a lot of requests for auditorium upgrade, for gym floor, and they are very, very expensive. So with this 45 million, how many projects are you gonna be able to do? And can you also give us a list of the projects, um, the school that, that are getting this uh, upgrade? I, I, don't, I don't at this time have the exact figure, but I can certainly get that. But those projects um, would be actually in the capital plan, and so they would show up school by school. Uh, we have, I think we can certainly share with you by council district what schools will, will have those types of projects. I mean, that would be helpful, but it seems like 45 million allocated will definitely not be sufficient when they're talking about just fixing a gym floor is over a million dollars. And we're, we're trying to be helpful, but it's just too big. I mean, we don't have that kind of capital uh, budget per council member to be able to fix a couple of gym floors and upgrade a couple of auditoriums. Um, but definitely in some of the schools, we see like the auditoriums and the gyms are fully utilized uh, by the school, especially now a lot of our high schools have co-locations. So like my Seward Park camp, uh, campus has five high schools in there, and I have a middle school that has two other high schools uh, with it, uh, middle school IS-131, and they all came in for requests for their gym and, and for their um, auditorium. And also, furthermore, the, their space is highly utilized by the community, especially the auditorium and the gym, because they have after-school program, they have evening program. So it's a good investment. Uh, but it's somehow, how do we make sure that we can allocate more capital funding um, in this area so that we can take care of those projects? Council member, we recognize that there are those situations throughout the city. We unfortunately have tremendous amounts of competing priorities throughout this city, having to do with overcrowding, having to do with building accessibility, having to do with these. I know, I know. That's so, why you know, we, we do the very best we can with the funding that we have. I mean, on one hand, we could, you know, build more new school and make sure the developer puts in money, the one that's creating all these impact, overcrowding, and they're not putting in a dime because they're building these projects as of right. And that's what's happening in my district. And I know that we're getting a new school in Trinity Place. And it really bothers me that we're going to have to pay for the school. And this building is going up as of right. And we're paying for the school. And we can't get it big enough so that we can have a full-size auditorium and a full-size gym. And that's what the parents and the teachers and the principal are saying. We need a full-size gym and full-size auditorium. So I think going forward, we have to figure out how to get these developers to pay. Uh, but that's something that we'll work with you on that. Because the school in Trinity, we're still fighting to get a full-size gym. <laughs> And my last question is on the preschool, on the pre-K. Um, the list that I got, the two site in my district, uh, one on Washington Street, a capacity of 108, and it's gonna cost over $12 million um, to do, and I have one on two Lafayette, it's only 32, 36 seats, and the cost is over seven million. I mean, these are huge numbers. Um, so my question is, how much rent are we paying, and are these long-term leases in this space? Well, first of all, the, the costs that you're, you're discussing right now, I believe, are the capital costs. Those are the construction. Converting non-traditional spaces to actually classroom spaces, that, that was the difficult part of that, and in particular in Manhattan, where the costs are, are very, very high. So those are the big things. As far as the lease, length of the lease is concerned, we'll have to get back to you on that. I mean, it'll, it'll be great to but see what, you know, what the city are putting in for these places. Because a lot of time, you know, it's hard to find facility, yep. but especially my district, it just costs so much um, to convert these office buildings 
um, into classroom space, okay. and then we still have to pay high rent with uh, it, it might not be the most cost effective. I've just been told that the, the site that we're talking about with 36 seats actually is a city-owned site, and so we will own that. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin, Council Member King, followed by Council Member Landert, followed by Council Member Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Good to see both of you as always. I know we have to work with what we have to work with, and we work with what we do work with. So thank you again for all the work that you're doing working with what we have. Um, can I get one of these? <laughs> I just want a new one. I got some space. So let's figure out how we can get a new one. So I really would appreciate that. But I wanted to um, jump in to follow with something that Councilman Drum talked about, the Smart School Bond Act. I know in 2014 that was passed, and there was about $2 billion that was in there. What is the process? You, because I heard you talk about the amount of money that you were going to use for technology and AC. But where are we in the process, and how much of that $2 billion is actually going to come to the city with sure. what you have done? So of the total Smart Schools Bond Act, about $783 million uh, comes to New York City. Uh, where we are in the process is we have submitted our pre plan to the state. Um, we've uh, divided it into three categories, technology, uh, universal pre-kindergarten seats, and TCU removals. We've submitted the plan. The Smart Schools Bond Act Review Board now has to review the plan. Uh, we anticipate that we will hear back from them towards the end of the summer. They may ask for some changes. They may you know, make different suggestions. We don't know. Um, but we are actively in the process. Okay. So right now we really don't know when that money is going to come down to the city. Okay. And when it does, do you think, uh, you know, we talk about technology and the air conditioning is because some of our buildings are just 18th century old, um, and how do we improve the ACs? Do you think with the technology money that when it does come down, that can be utilized for ACs? Because I know we keep asking for our capital, our, you say our capital money doesn't qualify, but how do we, I don't know, if we change the system or we find ways for it to qualify? And, you know, at the end of the day, kids are still passing out in the classroom. I, I pass out a few sometimes in the summer myself, going to visit somebody with 92 degrees and there's no breeze going through. Right. So how do, we, how, do we, so how do we help you with that? So the funds from the Smart Schools Bond Act are very clearly delineated what we can use them for and therefore what we can't use them for. Air conditioning is not uh, among the technologies that we are able to use Smart Schools Bond Act proceeds for. Um, that has to be for infrastructure to support uh, connectivity. So it can be uh, wiring, it can be routing, uh, it can be um, network uh, equipment. And so we anticipate that we will be using the technology pieces for that infrastructure. Um, then you can, we can just buy the AC, at least the infrastructure being placed for air conditioners, if I mean you correctly. So we can't, we can't use it for electrical upgrades for air conditioning. We can't use it for air conditioning units. So that's why uh, those funds are in another part of the capital plan. The Smart Schools Bond Act funds are only in the areas that we are allowed to use them for by law. Okay. Um, and one of my final, qu final questions, MWBs. How, I would like to know how do you, SCS, is going to support our NW? I had a, I had a very... I won't say disturbing conversation, but I had a conversation that kind of took me when I sat before an MW and there were no women in front of me and there were no minorities in front of me. And 92% of that business was not minorities and was not women. So I'm saying to myself, how real or someone manipulating the MWs to just get to tap into the business because it's not really women or minorities who are running these businesses or getting paid from the funding that's scheduled to give MWC opportunity to compete. How do you support it and where are you right now? Okay, I'm very happy you asked me that, Council Member, because we have probably the finest MWBE program in the city, if not the state, if not the country. Okay. We have a tremendously active uh, Chief Diversity Officer who runs our Business Devel Development Unit, and we have uh, currently 722 firms MWBE firms that are certified and qualified. 
Um, we have also 134 firms that are in our agency's mentor and graduate mentor program. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we'd like to, to talk to you about it. Please. It's a program basically that takes small um, new emerging contractors and trains them in our, in our processes and works with our construction management firms to be trained on the job. And with that, uh, they, go, they go through that. They're allowed to bid on projects while they're in that process. Then they go on to the graduate mentor program, which gives them the ability to build on, bid on larger projects. From there, they go on to regular uh, capital improvement projects. But one of the things, we've created a, a loan program for our mentor pro uh, contractors, a bonding program for our mentor contractors. Um, and then this year, for the very first time, we created a program with our local community college that trains these young people who are in business majors, actually, to do uh, the back office work, like uh, requests for payment and, and bidding and so on, uh, to work with the mentor contractors. And they are interns for the School Construction Authority. So the mentor contractors are getting this opportunity for free help. So we are extraordinarily proud of it. Our last year, I think our uh, contracting was approximately $600 million for MWBEs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your time. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Councilmember King, Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Miller, followed by Councilmember Gradenchik. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good, as always, to see both of you, and uh, we appreciate in District 15 uh, a lot of the work that you have done and are doing. I spent a lot of time this year at uh, MS 839 PS 130, the K 437 building, which is just magnificent. Um, we appreciate your your uh, patience and work with the PS 32 MS 442 community. We are looking forward to getting that new capacity, but we appreciate it being done in a way that will enable 442 to have a successful relocation first. So thank you for your forbearance. And we also appreciate Melanie's work uh, with our team trying to figure out at the northern end of my district how we can arrive at something that will achieve some new capacity that will help uh, substantially in the district. So thank you for all those things. And I also am really encouraged um, on the bathroom uh, project. And I just want to appreciate that's really a partnership between the council uh, and the administration and comes out of the frustration that so many members of us uh, have had and that we were able to add significant capital to the budget and work together there and that is moving forward in a productive way and so it's not on the participatory budgeting ballot every year um, and we're seeing some real progress. Um, but I'm eager that we use that as a model to move forward on air conditioning. Uh, you've already heard I'm about the fourth council member to mention it. Um, and I guess, you know, uh, you know, while Councilmember Johnson spoke to the need for electrical upgrades in the context of the science lab, you know, I think air conditioning sounds like something that's kind of an amenity, but I, you know, I looked up, I pulled up the number of Central Park cooling days, the number of cooling days in New York City, and unfortunately a consequence of global warming is that we have more than a hundred more cooling days, days where you need air conditioning, uh, that's obviously especially true in May, June, and September, than it was a decade or two decades ago and our kids just can't learn in many of our school buildings on an increasing number of hot days and we're losing the months of June and September and we can't afford to lose two months in schools that don't have air conditioning. So, you know, we talked about this at the preliminary budget hearing and I was hoping by now that we would be making some progress on a framework. It's not easy to figure out where that money is going to come from. There's the capital for the electrical upgrades and of course that's a building by building assessment figuring out how to solve the problem and then we're going to need money on the expense side as well. But right now what we're doing is uh, essentially making the schools buy the units themselves which either means uh, it's terribly, terribly inequitable. The schools in my district where the PTAs can raise the money for air conditioners, uh, I'm telling you those kids don't get any hotter than the schools in Councilmember King or anybody else's district. And it's not fair to have it come from the pedagogical budget either. So we, we've been trading numbers back and forth, I know. We gave you some estimates that we had, but we're told you guys are still working on them. We need a plan. Uh, and I think like with the bathrooms, the council is willing to work with you. We recognize that this is a high priority of members and therefore it's got to be on us to push given so many other needs. 
but we need you to help us develop that plan. There's no way we're going to get there otherwise. And if, you, if there's going to be a resume component, we're open to that. If you'd rather do it like with bathrooms, where you make the assessment of the ones that are most in need, we're open to that. But right now, we don't have a plan. Um, and we've got too many kids in schools where they can't learn on hot days. And I would just like to ask you, you know, how are we going to figure out how to make a plan together to start making the investments uh, to bring the air conditioning needed for our kids to learn? So, um, as we said earlier, I think, I think we uh, very much appreciate the spirit that this needs to be something that can be equitable uh, for schools uh, and that as what we would consider uh, as part of the $50 million that is already in the capital plan for electrical upgrades, um, the economic uh, population of the school or the demographics of the school we think is a very important component of how do we prioritize within all of the schools that are looking for ele these electrical upgrades. Um, and we look forward to working with you on this. And I think we will yes, come absolutely. back to you and with a, here's how we would go about it. Okay, and if you could do something else so that helps us get the cost, I mean, I think it's gonna take a lot more than $50 million over the next few years to bring air conditioning no to the schools that need it. So I guess I don't know, I'm, not, I'm eager not mm -hmm. only to hear you know, how you're thinking about prioritizing that 50 million, but what you think the need is on both the capital and the expense side. And, and having a framework for prioritization is also good, but let's, let's set a real goal here. Let's figure out the total number of buildings that we need to do the upgrades and, and buy the air conditioners. Let's cost it out. You can set, you know, help us set useful priorities. Let's put a timeline in place and figure out the resources we need to get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Chair Grillo, uh, I do remember when I was teaching that um, they did come in at one point and they put in wiring and some of the classrooms got air conditioning. Is yep. that a starting point maybe where we, where we could figure out what I, was done in the past? Do we, do we have a record of that? Do we yes, know where that was do. done? As a matter of fact, <clears throat> it was called, it was a program called Project Cool Schools. I remember right. that. that I'm probably the only one at the SEA still around long enough to remember that. <laughs> but I could certainly look up and see how it was determined, how, how that was done, and uh, it was done in a cost-effective way. I remember that. So, if I yeah, recall, too, I think it was started. done in response to um, summer school when we had a broader, a larger number of students going to summer school. And um, the rooms that were prioritized were rooms in which those classes would be held. Yeah. And, and obviously, Mr. Chair, that would be appropriate. You know, having a summer school program in your school should presumably be one of the things that gets you higher up the priorities list to... So actually, lessons. one of our criteria for selecting buildings for summer school is buildings that have air-conditioned classrooms. So we centrally fund for summer school to buildings that are already air-conditioned and so students won't be in that heat. Well, if, if you've been around a long time, I've been around a long time, too. So. <laughs> Uh, next one is Council Mil Councilmember Miller, followed by Councilmember Grudenchik, Combo, and Kalos. Thank you, Chair Drum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I, I do, obviously, all the, there's nothing new under the sun here, so I, I'm just going to repeat some of the things that have been said here. Um, but I, I do want to talk about the, the cost of uh, extending the bathroom program and um, how many more bathrooms. First of all, what is the cost? Let's be general, because I know obviously different buildings have different costs associated. Um, and the reason why I've asked, because obviously we, we've been asked to do it, we continue to be asked to do it, and my, um, one of the winners in participatory budgeting uh, was, local bath, was, was bathrooms for local school there. So nothing like real-time numbers. Uh, so the bathrooms that we have completed as part of this project have cost about $75,000 per bathroom. Oh. Okay. That's a little less than I thought. And, and what, what's the average time of completion from start to finish? Um, I don't have a specific time frame on that okay. here, but we can follow up. Okay, thank you. And then the other winner was uh, adaptive special needs equipment for our two District 75 schools. Um, is that something that school construction is, has uh, provided in the past 
have you seen it? Is there anyone? And I, I, I don't think there's anyone in the other in the borough of Queens mm -hmm. that have this equipment for our District 75. School. Is this the sensory gym that you're referring? No, this is actually playground equipment. Playground equipment. I, I'm not familiar with it, but we'll certainly take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. So we've, there are other winner of our participatory budget. Oh. So we're going to be outfitting PS 170, I'm sorry, 147 and, and 136, which kind of drives me to the TCUs because both of them have the special needs program. The District 75s are located in the TCUs outside uh, of those schools. So I, I know it's going to be a tight fit, but we want to make sure that they have the same access as the rest of the students do in, in terms of activity. So we're going to be doing that. So I did notice that they weren't on the list of, of, of uh, TCUs to be removed. Is that because they are District 75 and they're lacking space? It, it's because we need to identify a new location that would either uh, we would be able to relocate those students to or how we would be able to move them into the main building. Mm -hmm. their schools. So that is about capacity in those areas uh, where I think this is among our and, more and, and how 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 diligently are we uh, I, looking to identify uh, additional capacity, in particular in, in the buildings, but if not necessarily uh, in the buildings somewhere in the district as we see uh, schools being co-located quite often. Yes. with new schools that don't exist from outside of the district from and and we still have district 75 schools standing alone in TCUs I think that's kind of a travesty so we are very focused on uh, thinking through different scenarios of how we can ensure that we move D district 75 out of TCUs it is we agree with you um, we don't want to see these students to continue in t TCUs in particular uh, and we're working very hard to try to come up with how might we create space but that also enables those students to have inclusion opportunities with their grade level peers in a general education so program. So on, on some of your mandated programs such as the, uh, the lighting replacement and so forth, is that being done in-house? Actually all the designs have been done in-house which has been a terrific benefit for us because mm -hmm. we're able to turn them out very, very quickly. Uh, the projects are bid out to contractors. On, for, not on the lighting repair, lighting repair for, is being done by? No, the design for the lighting fixture replacement is in-house SBA, okay. but the actual construction Work. is being done by contractors. Okay, uh, and, and where, there, where it is done outside of when it's being done externally, are they union shops? Yes, actually, because we have a um, project labor agreement with mm -hmm. the unions, and so our work is done by union. Excellent. And, and let me finish it. So I assume that PS36 and PS176 are, well, uh, 36 is up and running, thank God. I'm sorry, 360. Yep. And 176 is due to open in the fall, and I see nothing, no further new construction. Uh, no, it's for not so far. 29. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're Council Member Grudenchik, followed by Cumbo and Kalos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, good to see both of you. I think I saw one of you on Friday. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming out, Lorraine, and um, for being so attentive to the needs of uh, 109, uh, which is in Queens Village, and I really appreciate your spending uh, several hours there. Uh, it was very, very important uh, to the community, and uh, I gave you till 10 this morning, but I'll give you till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to, uh, to fix everything. Um, and thank you for your commitment to building, um, beginning the Build a Science Lab uh, this fall. Um, I, the Chancellor was here just um, this morning and I had asked her as I've spoken to you before um, when, when I went to meet with you about some of the issues in my district um, about the Padavan campus and the lack of a bathroom and anecdotally I am hearing from responsible sources that people are using facilities that are not designed to be bathrooms. That's, 
think I put that eloquently. I hope that uh, I hope you understood what I'm saying. So, yes. because it's a long walk, it's a 15-minute round trip to the closest three schools there. The high school is open, but um, you know it's a 15-minute walk for young people. It's a lot older for somebody in a walk, a lot longer for somebody in a walker. So, um, the chancellor said they would look at it immediately, and I'm just reiterating that message. And um, I just want to um, to say that we are also working. Um, as we develop uh, those 52 acres at Creedmoor um, to identify a, a site uh, for a school um, to relieve the overcrowding at PS 18. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I only have nice things to say about these two ladies, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to relinquish the rest of my time. I know, that I, know, I know they're working hard. Uh, I've, I've been with them, so <laughs> I know they're working hard to take care of uh, the issues of my district. So thank you very much for being here today. You're here, and uh, they are good women, so thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cumbo and Kalos. Thank you, Chair Drum. Just have a few uh, district-related questions. Um, as you may know, I've heard the discussion and conversation around the PS307 and the PS8 rezoning, and there was a lot of discussion around what exactly that was going to mean, particularly for PS307, we understood that there were going to be some capital upgrades um, and improvements to that school and that a lot of resources were going to be put forward uh, to bring it to being a state-of-the-art school um, as that particular school district is in need of. And the other question that I wanted to ask was also about uh, Boys and Girls High School and wanting to know um, there have been a lot of conversations about expansion, about additional schools potentially moving in, and a lot of that is in limbo. But at any rate, Boys and Girls High School is certainly in need of capital improvements and bringing it up to the speed of a state-of-the-art school as well. So let me address the second one first. Uh, Boys and Girls High School, we have posted uh, a proposal and we have worked I think very closely with the members of the boys and girls community, with uh, the members of the Medgar Evers community, with the elected officials. The proposal is to relocate the Medgar Evers school to the boys and girls campus um, and originally we were proposing to do that in two phases with uh, part of the school moving this September and part of the school moving the following year. We heard a lot of feedback from the community that they wanted the school to move at the same time all together rather than in two parts. And so we have revised the proposal so that it would move in 2017. And a big part of why it would need to be in 2017 rather than this September is because we do need to spend time working on some upgrades to that building uh, to ensure that it has the same level and caliber and, and quantity of science lab facilities as the students at Medgar Evers currently have in their current building, um, as well as additional uh, work there. So I know we have a fairly comprehensive program of upgrades for that building that are in the works. Whether that transition takes place or not, uh, the concern has been would those upgrades and those science labs and all of those resources come to Medgar Evers, whether that merger takes place or does not take place? So we have not proposed a merger. What we've proposed Relocation. for Medgar Evers to relocate. And so what we want to ensure is that all of the schools in the Boys and Girls Campus all have access to the same quality of, of resources in the building. Um, so I believe that that proposal uh, will be addressed at our June 20th uh, panel meeting. Is June 20th the correct date? So for us, somewhere around there. Okay. Um, on the PS307 and PS8 rezoning, thank you very much for working with us because I know that, that you were among the group that worked very closely with the Department of Education and the community uh, as we listened to all of the feedback and took the extra time for the greater engagement that led to the successful rezoning. And so we thank you for that. Um, and I know that um, we are, uh, I don't know what the specific plans are for 307, but I know we are actively engaged with the principal at 307 to understand what the needs are as the building uh, accommodates additional elementary school students. Um, okay. we're, we're excited to see that community grow. I want to just uh, reiterate how important it is to me to make sure that particularly those schools 
um, Medgar Evers, excuse me, that Boys and Girls High School, whether the relocation takes place or does not take place, that those upgrades are provided for those students and we're not just waiting for an additional school to relocate there. And the other one with PS307, that community is understanding that there are going to be some capital improvements um, in terms of making it a state-of-the-art institution. Wanted to go into minority and women-owned business enterprises. Uh, you're doing some incredible work um, in terms of the internship program, the Minority Women Local Business Enterprise, the Opportunity Academy. Wanted to know what more can SCA do to ensure other agencies follow your lead um, in regards to MWLBE, and what more can SCA do to ensure that MWBEs receive every opportunity in procuring city contracts? Ah, that's a tall order, uh, but I do appreciate your kind words. This is a very important part of our program. We're very excited about it. Um, we are working very, very closely with the other uh, city agencies to, to um, do our best, provide them information and, and some of the systems that we use, uh, tracking systems and the like. Um, I don't know how much influence we will have on their getting more city contracts, but I can tell you we will give them any information that they need in order to make their programs work better. I, I, I really can't say more than that other than to say any agency, that, and we've had many come in and you know, go over our systems and meet with our folks and try to model as best as possible uh, our system. Because here it says that you awarded nearly 66 million through 144 contracts to MWLBE firms. So with that, if you awarded 144 contracts, how many total contracts did you award? Right, that, that 66 million mm -hmm. uh, is for our mentor program, mm -hmm. which is a separate, a separate program from our general MWBE. Mentor programs are emerging contractors, small businesses, MWBEs that are uh, certified as such, and they work with us in almost a training program where we have actually construction management firms working with them on, on their actual construction piece as well as our own internal staff training them on back office information and things like that. So they go through that pro process as mentor firms for a number of years until they bill a certain amount of, of dollars and or they're in the program for four years and then they graduate to the graduate mentor program. While they're in this training, mm -hmm. they are bidding on work. So that's the 66 million. Overall, on our MWBE program, we last year I think went close to $600 million okay. in contracts. So out of that 600 million, 66 million went to MWBE so the, the firms. Small, no. Six, 600 million went to MWBE firms, 66 million went to our mentor firms. I see. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Council Member Kalos. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for your partnership uh, with participatory budgeting. And I think we're in line for three or four green roofs in my district, which folks have been working on. and. Just it's been a pleasure to work with you and the team. Uh, there's a, a larger issue that I'm not sure is SCA's issue. It is a larger city issue uh, with the mayor and everyone involved. But uh, for I guess now this is my third year asking about school seats. The Department of Education has identified need for 82,811 new seats citywide. However, only 44,348 new seats are funded. And uh, this is particularly concerning given the fact that the Real Deal's annual fact book with condo development by neighborhood lists 12,725 new units on the market or in the pipeline covering District 2, but only identified a need of 3,232 seats. WNYC reported in 2014 that the Upper East Side, Carnegie Hill, Yorkville, Lenox Hill, and Roosevelt Island that I represent had 2,767 four-year-olds and only 151 UPK seats. Grateful that we were at 425 at the beginning of the year. We were able to add another 90 seats, bringing up to 515. After not getting an answer on how many parents applied, I just found out at the previous hearing that we had 2,500 applicants for UPK seats on the Upper East Side. 
with roughly 2,000 of them uh, referred out of the neighborhood where children are being offered locations here by City Hall in the financial district, which means they could take a one-hour commute with me each morning, which is not ideal for a four-year-old. Uh, what can we do to get seats built on the Upper East Side in Council District 2, sorry, Council District 5 in CEC 2 that we need? <laughs> so I'm on the, let's separate out UPK, because I think UPK, um, we work very closely with Deputy Chancellor Wallach on trying to identify where we need additional seats. Um, and I know that we have uh, agreed that we will come and look at some sites with you uh, if we can find some places to look for potential seats for District 2. In terms of the Upper East Side for uh, other seats, K-5 to uh, and middle school, um, the Upper East Side, we currently do not show a projected need uh, in the capital plan. Uh, we recently opened uh, off the top of my head, three new elementary schools on the Upper East Side and expanded the capacity at a fourth at PS 59. Um, and we have largely addressed, if not completely addressed, the wait list and, and uh, issues that existed just a few years ago. When um, were the but new we schools? do continuously re look at our enrollment projections every single year. When were the new schools opened in Council District 5? Because so I have PS not gotten invited to any school openings recently. PS 267, PS 151, PS 527 were all opened within the past seven or eight years. So there's an empty lot at First Avenue and 78th. We would love to put it there, but just given need for four-year-olds, and I'm hoping for universal child care. I'm hoping we can take care of everyone zero to three. And UPK, there is federal funding for three-year-olds, which means we don't need 80 or 100,000 seats. We actually need 200,000 seats. But just looking at it, I have 18 public schools in my district, at least 10 or 11 elementary schools. And if we were going to each elementary school have a UPK, we use the elementary schools to address the existing need, we would need about 200 seats per elementary school. And considering that my largest elementary school has 775 kids and most have on average around 200, 300 with the new sm small schools model, I think I need more schools if only for this UPK issue because it might be okay to just build a huge 2,000 seat UPK center on 78th and 1st where there's an empty lot mm -hmm. or we could build more schools, split the district up even more because this is the densest census tracts in the country and make sure that we have the school seats we need so that we can spread the kids out because with, with 10 or 11 elementary schools, the math is pretty simple and I don't think they have room for 10, uh, more than 10 18 kid per classroom classes. It's just, we don't have the space. So obviously I think there is need. Would you, would you agree with that? I think we will continue to work with uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach uh, and with you on assessing what we do need to do. Thank you, and uh, sorry to have to come and keep asking for it, but I keep hearing from parents every day. I just got emailed again. You can, anyone watching at home, if you're on the Upper East Side, you can email upk at bencalos.com, and we will continue working with you to find a seat. Thank you for all the great work that you do for the schools that uh, I have, and just I want to get more kids into our public school system. So uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Kalos. Can you put UPKs on a f uh, in a building uh, above a second floor? Is there a regulation on that? There's no regulation. Uh, we do, in some cases, have them on the third floor, first, second, and third floor. That's but the, the highest would be the third? That's it. And that's because of uh, fire yeah. concerns? Yes. So you have to get them down those steps, the little ones down those, those steps? Those little legs, they're yeah. hard to get down those steps, yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I was close on that. All right, I, we have two more questions, basically. Uh, one is on um, the facility replacement program. Uh, it allocates $62 million uh, in the 17 budget. Uh, last year it was at $288 million, uh, and back in uh, 2008 it was $1.3 billion. Why that drop in this? Sure. Um, well, a number of things. So first of all, as I said in the beginning of this capital plan, there were 70 leases that were coming due during the capital plan. A great number of those have been renegotiated, extended. 
so that eliminates the need to find replacement sites. In addition, we've, we've spoken with um, the Office of Management and Budget. Right now we're looking at 62 million, but they have assured us uh, that if a need arises, that they understand that funding would be necessary. But for the time being, this is all we're really seeing right now. So I think, I think we're covered. And that's only to relocate those who may have lost a lease? It, or is it, it for new leases? It, it, no, that's just for, for relocating um, existing leases if necessary. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then finally, um, it, regarding, I know council member had a question on the, um, the list that was submitted by the CECs and by the council members. Is it possible that we can get um, a, a list uh, to see those lists as well? Yes, I, I think we can provide that. They, okay. they are extensive, I will say that. They're extensive. Uh -huh. We're wondering if there's crossover, actually, in between what the um, council members are submitting and what the, um, the yes. districts are submitting. Like, I do go to the superintendent and ask him, mm -hmm. what are your priorities or what are the CEC priorities so that we don't duplicate them and hopefully rise them on the list right. in terms of the, the, the number of importance. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're interested in looking at. Yes, in some cases there is duplication. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Chair, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Rose. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you so much, Chair, and, um, and good afternoon. I, I want to start by thanking you um, for the Curtis High School Annex. Um, much needed, you know, um, and much appreciated. Um, and I understand we will be having a conversation offline, I'm sure, about a proposed harbor school? Okay. Um, and so um, my concern is about the mayor's um, goal for 60,000 market rate units and 200,000 affordable um, housing units um, in, uh, in 15 districts that are going to be uh, down zone, um, up zoned. And so um, with that, uh, have you anticipated an increase in, in the need for school seats? And if so, what is the plan? Is, are these seats included in the five-year plan? Well, I think that we've been working on all of these rezonings. We've been working very closely with uh, city planning, and we're looking at the timing of each and every one of these. Uh, I don't think the rezoning for the North Shore of Staten Island is, is will fall, will bring the housing within this capital plan. It may very well come in the next capital plan where we would, if necessary, include a new school. Um, again, you and I have met with the Staten Island Borough President when we talked about a particular development area that may become available and we would join very closely with that developer if there was an impact and a need for new schools. So I, I think it's, I think at this point, it's not, not that it's unnecessary, it's just a little too soon. So um, in the five-year plan, um, say there's 1,100 school seats for my district. Um, is that before the zoning or or inclusive yes. of the no, that's zoning. before the zoning. That's before the zoning. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I, I just have a, a, an unrelated question uh, about lead in the in the water in the schools. Um, we found, you know, lead in in some of the schools. Are is are there funds in the budget to remediate this situation? Are we going to have to um, replace? Uh, piping, you know, extensively. Um, are we prepared to deal with that? So where we have, we have actually just completed uh, complete testing of all buildings uh, in the Department of Education citywide. Um, and we have made uh, results of testings from prior years as well as most recent testing available for online for families, for schools, so that they can see the status of their buildings, and we are um, very grateful. We've been recognized uh, by several authorities as really being out in the lead and, and a model uh, on this issue for the country. 
Um, on Staten Island, we, as part of this retesting, we did f identify a group of buildings where they had at least one positive uh, test result. In those cases, we removed the fixture itself as well as the piping to the wall um, and replaced them. And in these schools, we are retesting uh, so that we can be certain that the work that we have done is effective. Um, in most of the tests, in fact, um, in, inclusive of the ones in your district, the positive result only came on what's known as the first draw. So water that has been deliberately left stagnant for at least eight hours in pipes and, and where lead comes from, it could be from, in other locations, it could be from the water supply itself. That is not the case in New York. Our water is uh, among the cleanest in the world. Um, where it could come from water that is sitting and can therefore gather, uh, metals can leach in when it is sitting stagnant for long periods of time. In almost all these cases where we had a positive test on the first draw, we had a negative test on the second draw, which is taken 30 seconds later. And that reflects the more normal usage of our school buildings where you know, kids will be turning on the fountains uh, over the course of the day or, or using water fountains. Um, and so what period we know of time with is that, with what, over what period of time is that water, water standing? Safe. Is that um, overnight? Is that, you know, the weekend? So for and the tests, it is a minimum of eight hours overnight. Uh, in buildings where we have had a positive result, we have a flushing protocol where on Monday mornings the custodial staff will come and flush the water through so that there won't be stagnant water waiting for children. Um, and we know from our tests that the second draw tests were negative that this flushing protocol is effective. Okay, and this is to be followed, it's sort of mandated in these schools every day? So the flushing every protocol morning? happens on Mondays, every Monday, for schools that have ever had a positive, that have had a positive result on their most recent test. The, the flushing protocol happens every Monday, and then during the course of the week, the, the pipes are used often enough that the water is fresh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to testify to today's hearing. I want to remind members that we're doing a member briefing in the members' lounge today. This concludes our hearing for today. The Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2017. Give me a second, guys, to get this out. Ooh. May 17th at uh, 10 a.m. in this room. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the Department of Youth and Community Development, the Department of Transportation and the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and the Taxi Commission, Limousine Commission. As a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Tuesday, May 24th, the last day of budget hearings at approximately 3 p.m. in this room. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearings, you can email your testimony to the Council's Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned. Good job. In my life that are unexpected.